Hey, folks. All right. Things. Okay. Am I lined up properly? I will be once it. Um, I need to shave. I haven't done that in a while. Either way, uh, let me get some music on the go. I will open up things in a minute. Um, oh. I was on the wrong audio device. There we go. Right. So. Why? Is it just a weird shadow over there? That's really strange. Where the fuck is... Oh, no, that is just the corner of the room. Okay, no, I'm just an idiot. It's just the shadow is much darker here than it actually is looking at it, but whatever. Um, either way, today, because um, this is the 100th homebrew stream, we're going to be going through basically everything I've made on stream before. Um, there is quite a lot of it, though. Um, there is there is quite a bit. Um, right. So I'm going to... I will, I will look at the spells, I think, another time, or, le or later on, because th that was actually the first thing I did. The first stream I did was, was do spells. Um, do I start spells or do I start something else? I'll start spells. Fuck it, why not? That should be it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. Totally. Word capture. A little, little hat. I couldn't find the bunting I used for my one year anniversary. I think I deleted it, but I did still have this hat. So I was like, I'm gonna keep the hat. And it also doesn't really get in the way. It's sort of this ticker here. Uh, oh, it does get in the way of chat though. So I guess I'll move that. Uh... Oh, fuck it. No, any only chops off names. You can still read the, still, still read the thing, whatever. So I want to have a look through some of the spells we've made on stream. Obviously, I can't really go, like, chronologically, because I don't remember the order that I made these. Like, I will remember some of the ones I, you know, from the first stream, but everything else is just kind of a blur. Um, I know age was relatively early on. Um, so, I'm basically, I just want to kind of go through things and just sort of judge, like, stuff that I've done. So, it's cantrip, touch, for a minute, you touch a non-magical object, brutally subject, uh, subjecting them to the passage of time, weakening them. The spell's effects differ on whether you target a creature or an object as follows. Creature, make a melee spell attack against the target. On here, the target's internal suffer the effects of momentary but harmful aging, causing it to suffer the following effects for the duration. The target speed reduced by five feet, and the first time it makes an attack roll and a ability check. Each turn that uses strength, dex, or con, it rolls a d4, it should be, it rolls a d, it rolls a d4. Subtracting the result from the roll, the target makes a wisdom saving through it. It should be the target can make a wisdom saving throw. Or use each of its each of its subsequent turns ending the spell on a success. Effects on itself on a success. I'm actually, actually going to make a list of, like, things I end up, like, tweaking slightly. I'm going to keep that off to the side here. So, object that the target becomes brittle and aged, gaining vulnerability to damage for the duration of the target. Object is large or larger. A five-foot cube centered on the point you touch suffers its effect um, instead. Uh, suffers its effect rather than... Uh, instead of suffers its effect rather than the entire object. Okay, yeah. This is cool. I like this. The, the effect on creatures is actually kind of interesting, like it's, it's, like, at low levels, this is legit worth your concentration. Like, dep depending on, like, you know, you're an artificer, druid, sorcerer, like, also, where the fuck do wizards not get this? That's weird. Um... Feels really obvious that wizards should get this. Agonizing Bond. So this is Warding Bond, but not. 
Well, the target within 60 feet of you, you gain, res you gain resistance to all damage. Also, each time you take damage, the target must make a con save. It takes the same damage you took on a failed save or half as much on the spell offense spell offense, you drop zero hit points, or if you and the target become separated by more than 60 feet. This is cool. I really like this spell. I think, I think it's, I think it's like, actually really good. <laughs> Um, I think that the fact that it's exclusive to Cleric definitely limits its goodness, but it does also give you resistance to all damage, so, you know, can't really complain. Um, a Cordia's Crescent Slash. I'm not sure if I like the weapon aspect of this spell. That is something that's sort of been on my radar for a while. This is, this is a fairly recent one, this is from like a few months ago. Um... Renish the weapon used in the spell's casting, so three arcing slashes of magical moon light. Each slash forms are 100 foot long and five, a line 100 feet long and five feet wide in the direction you choose, and that, go, that goes around corners. Each creature caught in one of the lines must make a dexterity saving throw. A creature takes force damage or radiant damage on the failed save, or half so much from the successful one. When you cast a spell, and after each time you choose the, dir the direction of one of the lines, you can fly up to 10 feet without provoking opportunity attacks. Oh, yeah, this does 12d6 damage. And provides mobility. That's... It's okay. Ooh, arcane artillery. You conjure three glowing missiles of magical force. Each missile hits a creature of your choice that you can see within range. Each missile deals 1d10 plus 3 damage to its target. The missiles all strike. This is terrible. Th this is actually garbage. This is a 6th level spell. Yeah, this this is this is actually just terrible. It does anywhere from like 4 to 13 damage per hit, like like theoretically, you know, if you roll really well, this can do like 39 damage. I mean, let me like any dice this real quick. But I'm pretty sure this is just bad. So, let me let me let me look at a sixth level magic missile. How does this actually square up to a sixth level magic missile? So you got three. So you got eight, eight d four. So it's three, and then four, five, six, seven, eight. No, yeah. So eight d four plus eight. It is strictly worse than just casting magic missile at sixth level. <laughs> It is like, like, very, very, very strictly worse. Why did I make this? Why did I, why did I do this? Like, like I know why I made it, but it is very, very explicitly worse than Magic Missile in every way. It's so bad. Like. I see what I'm trying to do here, is make it d10 plus 3, like, but I could just go, you know, 3d4 plus 3, you know? Because <laughs> um, uh, at that point, it's, you know, 9d4 plus 9, which is, you know, at that point, is better than a 6th level magic missile. And each one thereafter scales really well. Nice, nice. I so say I'm going through the spells I've made at the moment. I realise going through the spells alone is going to take some time, but um, I am, I am, I'm liking like I've only, I've gotten to one spell where I'm like I'm really not happy with this. Um, I think arcane artillery is like really fucking terrible. <laughs> it's really bad. Um, it being three d four plus three, it makes it upscale like really, really well. Like, really, really well. Like, at the moment, you're going to be, most likely at least, doing about 31. You're going to cast this spell and do 31 damage. Like, oh yeah, 31 to 32 damage, like, on average. Which is pretty good for, like, a 5th level spell that you, you know is going to work no matter what. That's a thing. Um, I need to go check Magic Missile and like... 
Okay. So this scales at 3d4. Seventh level. What does a ninth level casting of arcane artillery do? Not much damage. So, yeah, you're looking at 3d4, which is 7.5 plus 3 times 3 uh, times 6. So yeah, you're you're looking at like It keeps it keeps it keeps breaking. Ten ten point five times six is like sixty something. So yeah, that's um should be creature or object. Uh, what is this item? Um... Um... I said the, 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 the effect of the mask is interesting. Um... It would need to be more clearly codified as you can cast, you know, like, you are under the effects of you know, you can read the, you know, the other creature's surface thoughts as per the detect thoughts spell, and you can communicate telepathically. The final sentence, the final paragraph, doesn't mean anything. True names aren't a thing in 5e, like, they aren't, like, they don't exist. Um, it doesn't, like, they, they're implied to exist for, like, devils and demons and stuff, but they're not, like, actually a thing. Um, like, but otherwise, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting item. Um, bubble. A vial of soapy water, action, 30 feet. You can't draw a soapy bubble around a medium or smaller creature you can see within range. Pretend to trap them. Make a deck save or become incapacitated inside the bubble for the duration. A creature within the bubble reads, um... Targets... Tar in, in, made against a creature inside the bubble, instead targets the bubble. The bubble is a medium object and has hit points equal to 500 spells casting ability modifier. AC-10 immunity, that should be AC-10 first. As well as resistance to bludgeoning. Um, hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Cauterize. This this was a spell that I had a really, really tough time. Oh, this is this. Oh, I forgot. This is just an error. Um, I, I yeah, I had a really difficult time, like 
um, sort of determining the usefulness of the spell. I still think it it's bad. Like I, I still think it's terrible. Um, but it's interesting. I, I, I do, however, think it is very bad. Uh, Claire Audience. For the duration, you gain advantage on wisdom perception checks based on hearing. You, you gain immunity to the deafening condition, and you gain blind sight out to a range of 30 feet. That blind sight is really fucking powerful. That's a better C invisibility. I need to I need to change that. Like I don't know how I missed that. If anything, probably the best way to go about this is to just remove this and make it first level and just make it like somatic or something. Because, like, gaining advantage on perception checks based on hearing for a minute is, is, is cool. If anything, it would just be, like, just ten minutes. It doesn't need to be concentration. Like, if anything, if anything this kind of effect could just be, like, an hour. Um, nah, it, it needs to be the kind of thing that you need to, like, you know, use in an instance where it's useful. So, yeah, you're sort of, this, this is for, like, a espionage kind of campaign more so. Conjure dragon. Oh, okay, right. You summon a dragon. A drag. A dragon. Oh, dragon should be like this. Um. A dragon creature challenge rating seventeen or lower, which appears in an unoccupied space that you can see within range. The dragon. The dragon disappears, returning from whence it came when it dropped to zero hit. The dragon disappears, returning to from whence it came when it. It should just be. This is, why is that word? It's so poorly. Like what? What The dragon... When it drops the zero hit points, or when the spell ends, the dragon disappears, returning to... Returning to wherever it was summoned from. The dragon creature is friendly to you and obeys your co companions for the duration. Roll initiative for the creature, which has its own turns. It obeys any verbal commands that you issue to it, no action required by you, as long as you don't violate, as long as they don't violate its alignment. Um, if you don't issue any commands to the dragon creature, it defends itself from hostile creatures, but otherwise takes no actions. The summon dragon cannot take legendary actions or lair actions if it has them. When you cast a spell, if the dragon has a lair with regional effects, those effects take place centered on the point in which you cast the spell, lasting in the area for 1d6 days. That's cool. I fucking like that. Uh, if your concentration is broken, the dragon creature doesn't disappear. Instead, you lose control of the dragon creature. It becomes hostile towards you and your companions at the DM's discretion, and it might attack. An uncontrolled dragon creature might, can't be dismissed by you, and it disappears one hour, one hour after you summoned it. Alternatively, you may touch a willing... Oh, um... Just like that. You may touch a willing dragon when you cast a spell. If you do, instead of summoning a dragon, the dragon links itself with you. If you cast a spell again in the next hour, you can make sure to summon the linked dragon if it's willing. Uh, if you link with more than one dragon, the previous link ends. Okay. 
cutting current, you alter the moisture in the air, causing it to form a whip of pure water, striking out in a 30-foot cone in front of you. Each creature caught in the area must make a dexterity saving throw. On a failure, a creature takes 3d6 slashing damage plus 3d6 bludgeoning damage. I don't know, there's no comma needed here. And falls prone. So that's, uh, that's a cool spell. I like that. Death throw. This is a fun one. One reaction which you take in response to a medium or smaller creature within range dropping to zero hit points or dying. Range 60 feet, VSM, two golden disc attached attached with copper wire worth at least. Wait, that's from something else. Right? I don't, I, I don't know what that's in, what that could possibly be in reference to. Oh, apparently not. The creature's dying moment, she briefly takes control of its limbs, causing it to move or to lash out at nearby enemies. The target performs one of the following actions. It twitches as you animate it, causing it to crawl up to its walking speed. Um, the target attacks a creature within five feet of it, making a melee spell attack for, a tar uh, for the target. On a hit, the target suffers no damage if the target is holding a weapon or has a suitable natural we or has suitable natural weapons, such as sharp fangs or claws. You use those weapons to determine the damage, but... Um, the target may use those weapons to determine the damage, but still uses your spellcasting ability to modify rather than its own damage bonuses. Regardless, on a hit, the, t the, tar tar uh, the attack's target. Takes an extra. This, this is unnecessary. This is like most creatures hit hard enough. It grabs a hold of a creature within five feet of it, make a melee spell attack for the target. On a hit. On a hit. Um, on a hit, the attack's target is grappled by the target until the end of your next turn, whereupon the body falls limply to the ground or until the sp to the end of its. Whereupon the body falls limply to the ground or until the or until the spell's target. Using a spell slot second level higher than a chronic damage. Yeah, I feel like the, the attack doesn't need extra damage. Um, because it's just kind of like you're already getting a free attack just as a reaction. This is like actually really good. This is a cool spell though. I like this. Display memory. Choose one memory you have, which may be up. Um, up to as long as the spell's duration. Through mental projection, you transmit this memory to, um, to either up to six creatures of your choice within range, or displayed in a five-foot cube that appears within range. Regardless of how the memory is displayed, it plays out in real time exactly as you experienced it. The memory may include any or all feelings and sensations you felt during the memory, um, during the memory transmitting them. If you choose to display the memory in a five-foot cube, the memory displays only sight and sound. When you cast spell using a spell slot, a third or, uh, a third or fourth. Or higher, the spell's duration increases. Spell more. Fourth level. Uh, yeah, it decreases to four hours. So yeah, you can... Yeah, I, I, this spell's kind of cool. Like, one hours. One hour. Um, Epiphone. You should sound that travels far and fast. You create a sound or a single word that can be heard up to five miles away. The sound is not as uh, is not at a discomforting or painful volume. It simply can be heard at the volume of a shout within its area. Um, the radius is doubled for every higher spell level. <laughs> oh, it's a ritual as well, so you can just you know you can just say fuck um, every ten minutes <laughs> as much as you want. That's that is incredibly funny. <laughs> Just be like a wizard and just every 10 minutes, whenever you want, just just say whatever you want that can be heard in a five mile radius. That's really funny. 
Um, fatigue, you in induce a brief but overwhelming lethargy in a creature you can see within range. Tokens make a constitution saving throw at the target. So it's three levels of exhaustion on a failed save, or one level on a successful one. Levels of exhaustion gain this spell last until the end of the next turn. This spell cannot cause a creature to exceed five levels of exhaustion. This spell is cool. I, I like this. It is, it is a very... If they fail the save, it is a brutal debuff. I um, mean, it also combos very nicely with Sickening Radiance. Um... Friction, non-friction is really fun. You alter the ground, change the consistency to form uh, heavy drag or seemingly have no substance at all. One of the following effects, but 40-foot cube. Uh, moving across surfaces in the area requires uh, re uh, require the moving creature spend two feet of movement for every one foot it moves. Additionally, whenever a creature that's taken a dash action on this turn moves across an affected surface for the first time on that turn. Um, the creature must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or fall prone. A creature under the effects of a spell or magical effect that increases their speed, such as the haste or long strider effect spell, also makes the saving throw as if they were dashing. And the yeah, non-friction is whenever a creature enters the area. Um, oh, whenever a creature enters the affected area for the first time on a turn, it must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or fall prone and slide across the ground to the nearest unoccupied space outside the area. A creature slide, slides in the direction it was moving in when it entered the area. A creature also stops moving if it loses contact with a solid surface. A creature that has taken the dash action this turn, or a creature under the... Yeah, so I really like this spell. I think this spell is really fun. I don't know how good it is, though. Like, fric like friction, I think, is, is legit. Non-friction has the potential to be very funny to make people slip off cliffs and so I like this spell a lot this is really fun uh Gale Blade is a very recent one and uh Joe has been using it in uh in my Saturday game to, to reasonable effect I think you've cast it a couple times you have all three blade spells so you tend to just pick and choose whichever one you want to use in that moment but um uh, on a hit, the target suffers the weapon's normal damage effects, and you can immediately move up to half your speed to an unoccupied space within five feet of the attack's target without provoking opportunity attacks, as you ride magical wind currents to cut right through the target. The target then becomes surrounded by whistling winds until the end of your next turn. The next time you target the creature with a weapon attack before then, it takes... No, oh, you hit the target with a weapon attack before then. It takes an extra 1d4 force damage, and the spell ends. If you cast a spell while your speed is zero, you otherwise cannot move. The spell fails. Um, I like this spell. I think it's cool. Um, is it good? Not sure. Is it fun? Yes. I, I absolutely love it. Um, Gamma Burst. Fire two beams of intense radiant light out from you, obliterating most everything they touch. Most Both beams are 15 feet wide, 15 feet... Um, 15 foot, 15 foot wide, 15 foot high, and 30 foot, uh, 90 foot long lines stretching in opposite directions away from you. Any creature caught in the area makes a con save, and if it takes a bunch of radiant damage, half as much success. A creature caught in the area takes a bunch of radiant damage. Objects caught in the area are equally affected. That is not how that should be worded. That should be, it should be worded like shatter. like that. It's important. Graviton Magnet. This, this is another fun one. One reaction which you take response to a creature other than yourself moving into a space within range. You want to stretch your hand, gravitating the target creature back to its original position. The target immediately stops moving and is pushed back to the space in which it started moving this turn, and an unwilling, which, an unwilling creature can resist the spell's effects with a successful strength saving throw. This I like. I, I, I like the spell a lot. It's very fun. Um, grounding Bolt. You, you ground a powerful bolt of lightning through a creature you can see within range. It's targeting to make a con save and failure takes a notable amount of lightning damage and is knocked prone. On success, target takes half as much damage and is not knocked prone. Cool spell. A pair of copper wires and, and entwined together, one painted green and one painted yellow. <laughs> okay. I'd f okay. That's fun. Uh, 
a fun fact for Americans and also honestly English people, I guess, because most people probably don't know this. Uh, inside of English plugs, they have a grounding wire. Um, Eng English plugs are th a three pin. Um, hang on. I have a plug here. Ugh. A little like this. So you got this, this one here. This is, this is um, I can't actually get this plug open. Yeah, I, I, yeah, no, I don't have a screw. I can't open this. But um, close. Yeah, there we go. But um, yeah, the there is a grounding wire in there that helps deal with uh, electrical surges, and it is uh, uh, yellow and green. Um, it is like twisty. Um, I, I, whatever reference or not reference, but I respect me whenever I did this. Uh, thank you very much for the follow, by the way. Ah, uh, in traceability, a shard of mirror, four pieces of cotton, and a ball of string. The creature you touch becomes completely undetectable for the duration. The target is invisible, inaudible, gives us no odor or scent, and does not need somatic or verbal components to cast spells. Unless, unless in the presence of a creature with blind sight or true sight, the creature is considered or it's considered to automatically succeed on all dexterity stealth checks. That is a very weird wording, but I like it. Um, it's a very silly spell. Iron Wind Strike. Oh, this is, yeah, this is Steel Wind Strike, but for a single target. Uh, choose a creature you can see within range. Uh, make a melee spell attack against the target on a hit. It takes um, a, a lot of force damage. That is a lot of force damage for a single target spell. Um, that is like, holy shit. Okay, hang on. It is slightly higher than your average it's 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 a d10 more than your average third level single target spell so it's not insane but it is very very strong um mass revivify exactly what it says on the tin R waves of revitalizing, re revitalizing energy, breathing life into the recently deceased. Choose any number of creatures in the 30 foot radius sphere, center point you can see within range. For each creature, as long as that creature has been dead no longer than a minute, it returns to life with one hit point. Spell can't return to life a creature that has died of old age, nor can it restore any missing body parts. So, yeah, it is exactly what it says in the It is mass revivify. I think it's cool. Necrotic burst. You imbue an undead servant with a sickening power to erupt in a fountain of gore and pustulous acid. Choose a willing undead creature you can see within range. That needs to be capital undead. Capital U. We'll be coming back to this document later on, actually, because um, uh, because we'll be going through some of the magic items as well. As a bonus action on subsequent turns, you can cause the creature to explode, ending the spell. When you do so, each other creature within 20 feet of the servant must make a dexterity saving throw or suffer 5d6 acid damage plus 5d5d6 5D, necrotic damage. The target automatically fails this saving throw. A creature other than the original target that fails the saving throw suffers a disadvantage on the next attack roll makes within the next minute. Cool. Ah, simple one. Nova. You unleash an, explo an explosive wave of energy in a 30 foot radius around you with the force of a tiny collapsing star. Each other creature in the area makes a con save. Shit ton of force, shit ton of thunder. It is a very, very big destructive wave. I say that. This is a very bad destructive wave. Because <laughs> it is destructive wave, except it's 8th level and does, you know, it, yeah, it, it is, you know, it does more damage than destructive wave. But destructive wave, you can also pick targets and it knocks things prone. So, yeah, this spell is just kind of wank. Yeah, this, this spell just kind of sucks. If it, it needs to, you know, blah, blah. there we go. Because otherwise it's just like... You're fucking like, you're 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 the fucking paladin in your party is the, well. I guess the paladins have it. Yeah, they get it at seventeenth. But even so, Otaluke's Omega Sphere. Jemson cut into an orb like. Oh, that should be an orb like shape. I remember this one. It's weird.
You form a sphere of incredible protection around you. Whilst you concentrate on the spell, your speed is zero and you can't gain the benefits from any bonus to your speed. The sphere begins as an intangible field of bluish energy that expands out from, point at which, from the point at which you cast the spell at a rate of 2 feet per second, or, or by 12 feet at the end of each of your turns, passing through solid objects and creatures with no effect. The spell ends if you ever leave the sphere. Um... As an action on your turn, you may end. Oh, this should be this should be later on. Oh no! Okay, right. No, I understand. As an action on your turn, you may end the spell early. Um, Causing the sphere to cease growing. As an action return, you may end. Um, so, in passable sphere, the sphere transforms into a permanent solid barrier of magical force. Nothing, not physical object, energy, or other spell effects can pass through the barrier in or out, though a creature in the sphere can breathe there. The sphere is immune to all damage except that dealt by the disintegrate spell, and a creature or object inside can't be damaged by anything by attacks or effects originating from outside, nor can a creature inside the sphere damage anything outside of it. The wall also extends into the ethereal plane, blocking travel, ethereal travel through the wall. Uh, damage dealt to the sphere by the disintegrate spell is restored at a rate of one feet per hour. Uh, one, one, one foot per hour, or is instantly fixed with the casting of Odaluke's Resilient Sphere or, or Wall of Force spells. That's fun. Illusory Sphere. The sphere permanently masks its contacts with, with a grand illusion. The creatures outside the sphere to creatures outside the sphere, the interior of the sphere looks, sounds, and smells in a way that you choose when you cast the spell. Thus, a city can vanish into a small woodland, or a great citadel can appear a barren hillside. If you choose, the interior illusion persists for creatures outside of the, uh, the sphere, too. This... This should not be here, because otherwise it just shits on Mirage Arcane. The tactile characteristics of the terrain are unchanged, so creatures entering the area are likely to see through the illusion. If the difference isn't obvious by touch, a creature carefully examining the illusion can attempt an investigation check against your spell save DC to disbelieve it. Yeah, no, this is just, you know, let's remove that. Obliteration sphere, the sphere deals. Uh, to each creature object in, in, inside the sphere, except to you, a creature can make a con save against the spell, halving down on success for every minute you spend concentrating a spell. Yeah, so you can nuke people. <laughs> um, yeah, I like the spell. It's fun. Uh, plane shape. I'm going to skip over this one, but um, it is... You know what, actually, fuck it, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through. This incredibly powerful spell allows you to painstakingly formulate the cosmos into a new plane of existence. This plane is a design of your choosing and is sculpted to your liking. Oh, also components, a, a sphere of solid crystal depicting the creative plane's topography worth at least uh, 250,000 gold pieces, at least one terrarium of crystal glass containing a miniature biome worth at least 10,000 gold pieces, and a 120 foot tall obelisk of solid silver embedded with gold inlay worth at least with at least 10 million gold pieces, all of which are consumed. Um, a crystalline sphere using the spells... Um... Um... So, the size, the number of biomes on your, on your world, and number of biomes are determined by the quality and combined cost of the mural components provided in the spell. Or oh, quantity. Quantity. Oh. The crystalline sphere used in the spell's components dictates the overall size of your of your created world. Assuming the created world is a spheroid planet, the circumference the circumference of that planet is as follows. So, yeah, if you spend five million gold, you can get twenty uh, forty five thousand miles circumference, which I believe is the size of Earth. Slightly more. The Earth is uh, forty thousand. Um, oh no, no, that's kilometers. Ooh, that's 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 noteworthy. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. Um. Okay. No. No. I'm an idiot. Right. I was okay. I just can't read. 
Um, so yeah, uh, 45,000 miles is just under twice the size of Earth. Um, Earth is or just under 25,000 miles around. So you can make big shit with this. Um, additionally, the number of terrariums provided as a part of the material components for the spell dictate the number of unique biomes found across the plane. For example, if you provide three terrariums, one showing a series of rolling plains, one showing a lost forest, and another depending on acidic bog, the plane would hold a series of those different bio uh, environments spaced out however you choose. The plane holds whichever flora you place within your terrariums, all of which only partly all of which only partly grown um, when the plane is created. However, the plane contains zero fauna of any kind, such as animals. Um, as such, animals must be introduced to the plane through planar magic. If you have an in-depth understanding of the created plane and its layout, you can never be lost. Oh no, you, you have. You can never be lost on the plane. You may choose to create a permanent portal to anywhere on your new, on your new plane that you choose. This portal is a 10-foot radius spherical disc that remains in the spot where you cast the spell. You may choose for this portal to be one way, and which way the portal fa faces if it is. Um, additionally, planar effects such as uh, magical forces or effects on the plane, or alterations to magic on the plane, can be applied to the plane at the DM's discretion, but would invoke an additional cost of at least 10,000 gold pieces. Magical forces forces or effects on the plane or alterations to magic once the spell is complete you drop to zero hit points but are stable while in consciousness where you cannot regain hit points for seven days the first time you cast the spell you cannot cast it again so yeah you make a plane um, there's some minor wording things I needed to touch up, but yeah, it's 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 the kind of it's it's the kind of spell that players can never be expected to cast. Um, but like a lot of those spells that players can never be expected to cast, it provides a groundwork and a, and a mechanical basis for a DM to plan things for evil NPCs to strive for. This is like crazy high level thing where like some you know some evil necromancer wants to escape in a, into a world of their own making. Um, you know, that's, yeah, that's like what they want to do or whatever. Um, like, that's, you know, that's something for your epic level campaign to take, to, to do. So, power cord, make a range spell attack, yeah, it does thunder damage, I have to push five feet away for you and pull five feet towards you, your choice. Yeah, simple. Uh, ray of force. Now, this spell is... Is, is, is quite bad, specifically because the range is terrible. Um, I'm not sure if I've already buffed it in my home game or not, but, um... Because it's the kind of thing where, like, you can put... You can hit someone twice, and then they're pushed... If you target someone three times and you hit the first two, they're guaranteed... You know, if they're, you know, five feet in front of you, you shoot three rays at them, the first two hit, you've pushed them outside the range of the spell, so the third one misses. And I just checked, and I have actually fixed it in my home game. It is I changed it to 120 foot range. I don't know why I like didn't like I just like completely overlooked it. I actually had someone like test the test it as well, and I was like, wait, the spell has a range of 30 feet. This is useless. Um, I definitely changed the name of this in my home game. This is from the first uh, the first session. It's, uh, the 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 it's Ray of Babbling in my home game, but it's still been marked as Ray of Oof on here for for some time. Uh, make a range spell attack on a creature in the range on a hit target, lose the ability to speak or communicate in any meaningful way until the end of its next turn. During this time, any attempts at communication causes target to simply emit, emit a strange grunt of fake pain. <laughs> yeah, so they just, the, 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 yeah. It's mostly a joke spell, but is actually quite strong. Um, because this turns off casters. Like you, you, you just focus down the caster with this, and they just can't cast spells. Um, if anything, it might actually be kind of unhealthy, um, and maybe maybe the kind of spell that I would want to cut. Uh, Ray of Stupidity. Um, you unleash a beam of dull grey energy towards a creature you can see within range. On a hit, the target suffers a penalty of one of its mental ability scores that you choose and touches wisdom or charisma for the duration. This penalty is equal to 1d4 plus 1. The spell cannot reduce the target's ability score below 3. A lesser restoration spell or greater magic cast on a target. 
um, uh, ends the spell's effects early. Uh, when you cast at 4th level higher, you can affect 2 of the target's mental blue scores. When you uh, cast it at 6th level higher, you may choose 3. Is the spell any good? Uh, uh, I mean, it, it's on here. So, again, it, it's a good shutdown for casters. So, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, shadowy Strike. You bathe yourself in a swath of murky dark shadows. Once before the spell ends, if you are stood in dim light or darkness on your turn, you may choose another point in dim light or darkness within 60 feet of you, reaching through the shadows to it. You make each weapon attack you make this turn uh, as if you were stood in that space, using your senses if you were stood in both that space and the space you were in. The first weapon attack you make has advantage and deals an extra 1d8, no, 4d8 necrotic damage on him. I like this spell. It's cool. I probably need to look through the word in my own time, but um, it's, I, think, I think it's neat. Shifting Earth. I fucking love this spell. I really like this spell. Um, you alter the ground in a 20-foot cube centered on a point you can see within range. For each creature stood in the area, choose a distance up to 15 feet in a direction. And a di um, up to 15 feet in a direction that is horizontal to you. That creature has moved the chosen distance in the chosen direction. You cannot use the spell to move the creature into space that is not on solid ground or into a space outside of the spell's area. An unwilling creature can avoid being moved uh, with a successful dexterity saving throw, but a creature that fails at saving throw is knocked prone. Um, a huge or large creature succeeds on the saving throw automatically. So they can choose to just be moved. It is just that they're just moved. Like it's mostly harmless. Um, you know, like obviously you can and you can shift people in directions. You can pull someone into range of someone or move your allies into a flanking position, pull them out of danger or something. Uh, and enemies can try to resist it, but if they fail, they fall on their ass and are moved anyway. So they actually, you know, a lot of the times enemies will go, yeah, I'll just be moved. I'd rather do that than risk being moved and being knocked prone, which I think is kind of neat. Because um, it's a very minor effect. Um, spirit Expulsion. Uh, each creature caught in the radius must make a charisma save. They take necrotic damage. Spe spirit revealed until the end of your next turn. So it takes half as much damage. The spirit is not revealed. The creature's spirit is revealed. Suffers an additional 1d4 force damage first time it takes damage each turn for the duration. A possessed creature that fails at saving throw against the spell does not have its spirit revealed and instead uh, becomes... Oh. A possessed creature that fails at saving throw against the spell does not have its spirit revealed. Instead, it becomes no longer possessed. The spell has no effects on undead or constructs. I'm gonna... I need to go look at great oh no uh, dispel evil and good okay no that does that that does actually work time walk time walk is a staple spell in my home game now because it is crazy <laughs> um it's the kind of crazy where it's fun what what like watching people do crazy shit with time walk is cool um, it's 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 the it's the kind of spell that is as good as you choose to make it, um, but it is incredibly powerful. Um, it is you wind time around yourself, saving your energy for your next action. You gain an additional turn immediately after this one. On this turn, you may take one additional action as well as, as well as any movement bonus action or reactions you did not use on the turn you cast the spell. So, yeah, you you take an extra turn and. Um, on that turn, you have an extra action. So you spend an action this turn, and then next turn, you have two actions. Um, it is very, very strong. <laughs> um, like, people double dip fighter as wizard all the time, as just casters all the time, because it's crazy powerful. Time Walk is the same thing because uh, the two spell per turn rule is not two spells per turn it's if you cast a spell as a bonus action the only other spell can be a cantrip you can cast two leveled spells as an action there is no rule that says otherwise um, and time walk takes full advantage of that by being insane <laughs> uh, I do love it though I, I is it is an incredibly powerful spell Twilight Gate, you call upon the darkness to pull your enemies towards you, she's only creature you can see within range that makes a deck save, or sh as shadowy tendrils pull it into a dark portal. On failed save, creature takes, um... Oh, it does nothing. It does nothing on success. It's cringe.
updraft. You create a brief but powerful updraft that fills a 10 foot radius, 30 foot high cylinder centered upon you zero in range. Each creature caught in the area is pushed 30 feet into the air by the wind. An unwilling creature can resist the spell's effects with a successful dexterity saving throw. When you cast a spell, you may impart any number of targets with a protective gust around them. And if any of the chosen creatures' targets fall before the end, before the end of the turn, their rate of descent slows to 60 feet per round until the end of the turn. If the creature lands before then, it takes no falling damage and can land on its feet. It's a cool spell. I, I like it. I, it's it's my 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 main sort of preferred use for it is blasting yourself up onto platforms. You know, sort of you know jumping up onto onto high ledges. Um, it's you know you you and your party. If you are all of your group are stuck in a thirty foot pit, you're like, oh, I have updraft. I will cast my second level spell and spend a resource to get us out of it. It's it's a cool spell that solves a problem and also kind of funny in combat because you throw enemies into the air and they fall on their ass on the ground. It's a cool spell. I I, I think it's cool. Um, I will go through the smite stuff later on. Um, mm -hmm. Will I will I do that now? I don't know. How many of them are there? Quite a few. Quite a few. I mean, I'll just have a... You know what? Fuck it. I'm, like, I'm, I'm gonna... I'm not gonna go through the spells individually. I'm gonna talk about the smite tag, because I think the smite tag is cool, and I think it's one of the... One, one, one of the... One, one, one of the better changes that I've made that I think everyone should use. You know, there's a lot of changes I make that I'm like, this is for me and my table. This is to, for, for me to enjoy running my game more. Um, I think, oh yeah, welcome in. Um, but yeah, the, um, the, the, um, the, 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 the smite tag is, is specifically like a kind of thing where you should put this in your game because it is, uh, Oh, nice! I say, happy birthday. Um, but uh, yeah, the 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 the, the smite tag just makes all of the garbage smite spells in Five E good. Like it's a smite tag. Well, obviously, it does require a lot of spells to be reworded and slightly changed, but it just makes them good. It, it really does. Some of them should still be concentration, like like banishing smite, but a lot of them are just bad. A lot of them are just genu genuinely really bad, um, so they need to not be concentration, but they can't be, because otherwise people could pre-cast like seven of them before a fight and just instantly kill someone. So the smite tag exists for certain spells have a special tag, smite, such a spell empowers your attack rolls in some specific fashion and potentially grants other benefits as well. While under the effects of a spell with a, with a smite tag, casting another spell with a smite tag causes the previously cast smite, uh, previously cast spell to end early. Simple as. Simple as. It's a powerful effect. Um, yeah, it's, it's really just simple as. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with it. I think it's really cool. But I am going to close this for now. And I'm going to go fetch um, the second thing I did on stream. So we just went through like all the spells I've ever made on stream. And it took like an hour. <laughs> which is unsurprising. Um, but... I yeah, I was I was I was very happy with it. Uh, completed subclasses. Knight. So this is a subclass I made. Um, I think this is my second ever stream. Nice, nice, good stuff. I, no, it, wasn't my, it was my second ever design stream, I think. Um, so, this is me looking at Purple Dragon Knight, or Banneret, or whatever the fuck you want to call it, and saying, I can make this not complete dog shit. Um, so that's what I did. Um, as a bonus action, you may shout a rallying cry. Uh, rallying call towards a willing creature within 60 feet that can see or hear you. The target gains temporary hit points equal to 1d6 plus your charisma modifier. They last for some time. Whilst the creature has these temporary hit points, it adds 1d4 to attack rolls and saving throws. Um, this I have since changed to proficiency bonus. That's, you know, this this is an old document. I don't store my things here. This is, this is, the, this is, these documents are for drafts. I store my stuff elsewhere so players can actually, like, access them. Um, but yeah, the, the temp scales, it's, you know, you can 
give people temp. That's what you use your bonus action for. You, you know, keep people keep people up. Um, and it also buffs them by it also blesses them, which I thought was cool, and I still think is cool. Uh, Victor Victorious Strike. Um, Whenever you score a critical hit against a creature or reduce a creature's zero hit points, you may expend to use your rallying cry feature. If you do, each creature of your choice, they can see or hear you within 60 feet. Um, I must succeed on a wisdom saving throw. Um, on a familiar creature, becomes frightened of you for one minute. A creature frightened in this way can move toward the source, um, but must spend two feet of movement for every one foot it moves to do so. At the end of each of your turns, a frightened creature can repeat. Yeah, so basically, they become wary of you. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's cool. Inspiring Surge. I hate the end of that song, because it does that. When you use your action surge feature, you can choose a number of other willing creatures up to your charisma modifier. Within 60 feet, they can see or hear you. Each chosen creature can use his reaction to make one weapon attack. This ability is okay. There's a lot of ways to just sort of not do anything with it, but it is still cool. You know, f free, free, you know, free shit for action surge you know, the best feature in the game. Um, you can't really get wrong, um, even if it isn't, like, the best thing in the world. Shield of Allegiance, you gain one additional use of Indomitable. Additionally, as a reaction, when one or more creatures in safety feet, if you fail a saving throw against the same effect, you can expend a use of your Indomitable feature. When you do, choose a number of willing creatures within range that failed their saving throw equal to your Charisma modifier. Um, it should be up to your Charisma modifier, but that's, I'd probably fix that. The chosen creatures can re-roll their saving throw against the effect. A creature that re-rolls their saving throw must use the new roll. Once you've used your indomitable feature in this way, you cannot do so again until you complete a long rest. That's cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's okay. I'm not, like, crazy about it, but it's neat. Valorous Champion. When you use your second win feature, you can choose a number of other willing creatures within CTP, which your curse modify. Each chosen creature gains temporary hit points equal to the number of hit points you regained from your second wind. These temporary hit points last for one minute and provide the additional benefits of your Rally and Cry feature. Additionally, you gain proficiency in Wisdom saving throws. Honestly, this ability is kind of just whatever. I don't think it's particularly great. It's not bad, though. It, it, it isn't bad. You know, you're, you're, you're giving everyone an average at, at 18th level, you're giving everybody an average of like 23 temporary hit points, which... You know, actually, no. Yeah, when I put it like that, that's actually quite good. <laughs> um, I don't think it's like game-changing. But it, it's, it's a cool ability, you know? Like, it's it's alright. On the whole, looking back at Banneret, or at Knight, should I say, I... I like it. I like it. I think it could be better. Um, I, I think, I think, I think it could, it could be better. Um, but I like it. I, I, I do like it. Um, I don't think there's any like big things I look back on. I'm like, no, I would change this. I think I think there might be like some power things. Like, isn't is Valorous Champion that good? I'm not sure. Is Inspiring Surge that good? I think Inspiring Surge is probably good enough. Um, it's it's definitely um, party dependent in a way that might not be super healthy. But I don't think that's necessarily the end of the world there are a lot of features like that in this game like voice of authority is one of the best abilities in the game and it's entirely dependent on this um but literally all you need is like a rogue in the party and inspiring surge is just fantastic like it's just amazing um specifically a ranged rogue because if it's a swashbuckler or a person playing rogue poorly uh or an arcane trickster i guess you're gonna be sad because uh, they won't be within range <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm, yeah, I look back on this and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is, this is good. Okay, so this, this is an interesting one. So this, this is a subclass that I made. This is like the, the next homebrew stream I did. This is the Spirit of Hate, which I, frankly, barely remember making. I know what it does. I remember distinctly what it does, but that's it. So, uh, whenever a creature within 60 feet of you that you can see deals damage to an allied creature that you can see or hear, you must use your reaction to mark the attacker with the hateful gaze of your patron. Each time you deal damage to the marked creature before the end of your next turn, the creature suffers an additional 1d4 psychic damage. And it scales. 
Also, I would have changed that to proficiency bonus as well. I like this. This is a cool, this is a cool ability. Is it the best thing in the world? Probably not. Is it still good? Yes. It is, you know, doubles with, with Hex, works with, um, like, it scales very nicely. You can be, you know, it makes you a very good Blaster Warlock. I think it's cool. Will of Agony. Whenever you make an attack roll against a creature marked with your ventral gaze feature, you can choose to extend the will of your patron into your attack. Trigger the target's charisma score as its armor class for that for the attack, and any damage the attack would deal is instead dealt as psychic damage. Okay, I love this now. It... <laughs> How did I... Damn. Look at me out here having good ideas. Like... This is sick as fuck. This is fucking awesome. Like it is dependent on creature, obviously. You you know you can find like fucking Tiamat, and it's like, hmm, would I would I like to to target a, you know would I like to target Tiamat's twenty four AC or her thirty charisma score? Like you know, but even so, that's sick as fuck. <laughs> so cool. So reflexive hatred, whenever you apply your eventual gaze feature to another creature, you can immediately make one weapon attack or fire a beam from the Eldritch Blast cantrip against the target. I'm not sure of the wording of that. That doesn't feel... Like, obviously, rules is intended. It's very clear what that is supposed to mean. But I'm not sure if it works rules as written. Like, it probably doesn't. And that's something I'll need to look through in my own time. Like, the the, the intent of, of that effect is blatantly obvious to anyone who knows what Eldritch Blast is and does. But even so, I think it it could be better. I fucking love Will of Agony. That's so cool. As an action on your turn, you can call upon your patron to overtake the will of your enemies, forcing them to accept their fate as your at your vengeful hand. The target becomes... The target becomes marked by your vengeful gaze. There's something missing from this, like, there's like a sentence missing from this that determines how it targets, and I don't know how I missed that. Let me make sure that didn't, like, make it into, like, the final draft. Okay, as an action- okay, right, I, I fixed it in the final draft. As an action on your turn, you can mark a creature you can see within 60 feet of you. Uh, with your ventral gaze feature, which does not cost you a use of that feature, the target must then make a charisma saving throw. On a failure, it becomes paralyzed until the end of your next turn. I mean, yeah, that's pretty good. Because <laughs> uh, you also can use reflexive hatred and it instantaneously at least e blast them once. Obviously, the, you know, like, you, you don't get the auto crit from paralyzing them unless you're like a blade lock or something and you're already within melee of them, which is a cool build for this. It's objectively much worse than uh, than Blaster, uh, f uh, but it's still cool, and, like, you know, there is there is justification for a blade lock build just for this, just for Vile Retribution of paralyzing a guy, instantaneously slamming them in the face, big crit Eldritch Smite, and just killing them. Um, but... I like this. I like this a lot. Hey, your patron is an elusive being of malice and rage. This being sees their bond with you as a means to an end, using you as a tool to, uh, using you as a tool to enact their eternal vengeance. Be it a powerful wraith lord, a scorned deity, or some inscrutable manifestation of self-destructive emotion, the spirit of hate is a dangerous patron to swear oneself to. And as you could fit this description, include a Sararak, an ancient chromatic dragon, Garion, Moloch, a Kraken, Orthax, um, Raktul Kesh, or Tiamat. So, yeah, I, I fucking love this thing. <laughs> Most of it is Will of Agony, awesome. I, I like this. I really like this this subclass. I think it's I think it's really fun. It can probably do with like a fluff feature in here somewhere. I think that'd probably be the only thing I would change going back. Mostly just because the mocks tend to get that now. Um, and also, you know, non-combat abilities are fun. Maybe some kind of like thaumaturgy that makes them scary or something. I think it's fun. Uh, either way, I like this. I like this a lot. Um, so let's close this. Next one. 
Ooh. Ooh. The Barbarian Outlets. I have had several Barbarians in my home game since I put this in, and it has been pretty much universally loved by everybody that has used it. Um, people really fucking like the Barbarian Outlets. Not all of them are slam dunks, but the ones that people like, they fucking love them. Specifically, obviously, saying they like Reckless Attack is, you know, kind of cheating because I didn't fucking make it. But um, Overwhelm and Relentless Chase are super popular. Um, and uh, uh, which one? Uh, Braced Defense. There's another one on here that I have that isn't on here that I made after the fact because th that's that's one of the, the other more popular ones. Because fi Final Fortitude and Adrenaline Rush, people haven't used. Um, like, pe pe people haven't taken Final Fortitude yet. Um, mostly just because, like, it is kind of a feels bad. And it's something I, I want to go back and change in some way. Um, but the rest of them I'm, I'm very happy with. Ad Adrenaline Rush is a weird one because it's, it's kind of bad. Like, it is just the worst one, but it is kind of fun. Oh yeah, yeah, the extra one is Biting Grit, where you can add your con mod to your AC against one attack, and then until, uh, oh, and, uh, and until the end of the current turn, and when you do, at the end of the turn, your ace, you lose your, your con mod, so you lose unarmored defense. Um, so, you know, you, let's say you're a barbarian, you have 18 con and 16 dex, so you have 17 AC. Um... You, you know, an attack hits you with a 20, you can use Biting Grit, add your con mod again to your AC, you have 21, which lasts until the end of the turn. At the end of that turn, you go down to just having a 13 AC until the start of your next turn. Um, like, like, I, Biting Grit is, is cool. Um, Relentless Chase is super popular, I've had to reword it. Like, this, I've had to reword Relentless Chase like five times to get it to work. Uh, and not be like completely busted. But it, it, the position it's in now, I think it's fine. Um, like, not much to say about the outlets. I think they are, of, of all the changes I have made and like things I've added to like base classes and stuff, I think that the outlets have been like the one thing that basically everybody who's used them has just said, yeah, this is good. I like this. This feels good to use. Um, because it is just a straight buff to Barbarian. It, it allows them flexibility and all of them have a trade off. Um, Relentless Chase is gives you extra movement at the cost of not having extra movement on your next turn. Um, you know, you're you're banking on the fact that you know that you're you're you know the fact that you're going to have twenty less. You know, you're only going to have ten feet of movement is still going to allow you to hit things next turn. Um, yeah, I I like all of these. Um, you know, some I I will want to go back and change in some way. Uh, namely, Final Fortitude, I will want to do something with at some point, but. I I still like it a lot. Um, ooh, next one is next one is interesting. So, Magic races, Magic the Gathering, because I I run a Magic the Gathering campaign for my friends on a Saturday, um, and I made a bunch of uh, Magic races because uh, I figured people might want to play them. Uh, and uh, in the end, yeah, people did. Um, so I made uh, so these races did actually already exist in the Planescape or Plain pl Plain Shift, Plain Shift. Uh, the Plain Shift book for a number of the MTG planes at the time was around 2019. So it's like Ixalan, Innistrad, Kaladesh, that sort of era of magic just before War of the Spark. And. All of the races from those books are terrible. They're just badly designed, just just, just blatantly terribly designed. Um, so I went through and I fixed them. Uh, there's the core. Um, they have plus two dex, plus one whiz. They have climbing speed. Uh, they have precision athletics and acrobatics, and they have advantage on chains to avoid falling, uh, falling, being knocked prone, or being physically moved against their will. And that's all they do. That's super boring. They should have other abilities. 
Uh, that's super uninteresting. They really should have other shit, but what can you do? Uh, Merfolk, I have been using Merfolk in my home game. Um, no one's played one quite yet, but um, I have largely kept things as they are here. Um, I'm largely happy with them. Um, though the version of them that is here is very underwhelming. Uh, the Nagas, um, you have natural weapons, yeah, you have, you have Constrict, you have, um, you have your, your Fangs. When you take the dash action, you may lower your body to the ground with yourself with your full weight, move an additional 15 feet of the past axe, the dash action, but you lose access to your arms. Resistance to poison, you have advantage of the same made against poison, and you have the poisoner's kit. Nagas are interesting, I kind of like that. I, I, I think this version of them is, is kind of interesting. The Phyrexians is the one that actually got used in my home game because one of one of my players is a uh, is a quiet furnace Phyrexian. Um, so Phyrexians, they are hybrid humanoid construct. They are proficient in intimidation. They have plus two con. Machine orthodoxy, they have unarmored defense. Uh, or they just have built-in, like they have porcelain plating, they just have built-in mage armor. They have religion as a skill. Uh, progress engine have int, they have investigation. At certain point, at cer wait, 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 wait. Oh, I remember this! I remember this! This was crazy. At certain character levels, you gain a progress point. Each time you gain an ability score improvement, you may expend a progress point. If you do, you may choose to instead increase one ability score by three, one ability score by two, and one ability score by one, or three ability scores by one. Gain one progress point at fourth, twelfth, and nineteenth level. You may expend a progress point if you gain one at the same level that you would gain an ability score improvement. So, yeah, basically your ASIs are significantly better. <laughs> um... So yeah, you basically just gain three points during ability score improvement. That's really silly, but I like it. Seal Thrain gets Charisma, Infectious Form, when you hit a creature with a left tank, you inject a bit of Profane Echo. The target reduces current hit points when a magic creature receives them to start each other's turns. The point reduction is going to do necrotic damage for the purpose of interaction with resistance and immunities. Creature infected in this way makes con save at the end of each other's turns, if it enters the effect um, after it has succeeded on three saving throws. You can do it once more short, short long rest, and you gain deception. Interesting. Uh, Quiet Furnace has seen some use, um, you get smith's tools, um, you get fire resistance, and uh, you can use your reaction when someone like, makes a melee attack or touches you to burn them. It's okay. It's it's just kind of alright. Uh, molten body. And Vicious Swarm, you get uh, like Dwarven Toughness and Survival. It's very simple. Satyr was just mer just nerfing Satyr and giving them limited magic resistance instead of straight up magic resistance. It's you can choose to gain advantage on a spell uh, or magical effect saving throw. If you succeed, you can't do do it again. So if if you use this and still fail the save, you can do it again. Um, but once you've succeeded using this ability, you 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 have to short rest. And sirens, they have a scaling fly speed and they know friends. Yeah. I think a lot of these are still pretty underwhelming, um, namely the core is just like kind of bleh. but the core are also like their one defining trait in magic is having weird uh, chin tentacles and climbing and that's like their one defining trait. Um, so I, I understand why that's kind of anemic of like class features but also super boring. <laughs> um, yeah on, on the whole these are okay. Um, Certainly the, the, the Phyrexians I think are much more interesting than all the others, but um, yeah. What's up next? We are... We still have a lot to go through. <laughs> Ooh, okay, we're going to be here for a while. Um, admittedly, a lot of this is just like going through subclasses and such, but... Um, and I guess we've only been going for like half an hour since we finished the spells, and we have actually made like a dent. Next up is the Paradox Sorcerer, which I remember being weird. You're seeing Deception, History, or Persuasion. 
Whenever you roll initiative, you may use your reaction choosing any number of creatures you can see within 60 feet of you equal to your charisma modifying. For each creature, roll a d4. You may reduce or increase your choice to the initial result of a chosen of, of, of a chosen of a chosen creature by the number rolled. That's interesting, but also not interesting simultaneously. It's weird. Um, whenever a creature you can see within 60 feet starts its turn, you can use your reaction to enforce one of the following effects on that creature. Oh, oh, yeah, okay, this feature is fucking awesome. Um, so, faster, the target gains the benefits of the haste spell until the end of its turn. Um, slower, the target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your sorcerer spell save DC or suffer the effects of the slow spell until the end of its next turn. You can use that proficiency. This would have been changed to proficiency bonus because that's just the way classes are designed now. Pull through time. You can reach into, uh, into time pulling what you need. Point of history and bring it to now. As an action, you may expend any number of sorcery points choosing a non magical object. The chosen object appears in an unoccupied space you can see within 120 feet of you. The object must appear on solid ground. If one sorcery point is spent on this feature, the object must fit in a five foot cube, increasing by three feet for every additional sorcery points uh, expended above one. The object remains for eight hours after which it returns to the exact time it left. The feature is super fucking cool. <laughs> oh. I dropped the thing on the floor. Let me go pick that up. I'm probably... Okay, right. I got it. <laughs> I'm probably taking a quick break after this because it is fucking warm in here. It's like 22 degrees, but the humidity's high and... That light over there, that's a UV lamp for my tortoises that are, that are in like their cage over there. So this room is a sauna all the time in the summer. Um, I have a fan under my desk that is keeping me from dying, but otherwise, you know, I have a great time, uh, heat-wise. It's meant to go up to 33 degrees on Monday, which is the night that I'm going out to a room of, like, 200 people, so that's gonna be fun. Um, totally not gonna wanna fucking die the entire time. <sighs> I'm really not looking forward to that. <laughs> Either way... So displacement, you can use a bonus action and spend three sorcery points taking a point in time that you choose. You are transported to that place in time in the exact place you left. You remain for one minute until you attempt to meddle with anything in the place you teleported to or until you use a bonus action to return, after which you're transported back to your original time. When you when you are transported back, you appear in the nearest unoccupied, unoccupied space to where you were before you transported uh, back to the presence. Times you, have to, uh, you, trans, you transport to could include before we arrived here, a time when this building didn't exist, or before the door was repaired. The DM has the ultimate decision on when, you, on when in time you arrive, but can never send you to a place that would be harmful to you or would change the present in some way. You must maintain, you must concentrate to maintain this effect. Once you've used this feature, you cannot do so again to ignore the rest. I should be concentrate as if concentrating on a spell, because that's just the way those effects are worded. Otherwise, I think this really is kind of interesting. But it basically, its primary use is to allow you to, like, get into buildings. To just go to a point in time where the building just didn't fucking exist. Just go up inside. Um, this is okay. I think I'm... Dilation is cool. Time Jolt is alright. I think it's more like... There needs to be another interesting ability, like combat ability, in here somewhere for me to really care about this. But otherwise, I think it's alright. I think it's alright. So up next is an interesting one. Because I reworked Monk, and I didn't realise I did this as early as I did in uh, sort of streaming. But yeah, basically my rework to Monk was buffs all around and reducing the number of key you have whilst also giving you lots of means of getting it back. So spending key is never free like it is as a high level Monk, but also you're not shit out of luck if you run out of it either. Uh, I also split up a lot of the key abilities into things called learnable, into key techniques which you learn, and I made a bunch of other weird Monk passive abilities into disciplines which are exactly that. They are passive abilities you learn as you level up. Um, otherwise, most of the main class features are the same. They've either been ported into disciplines or into techniques. Uh, martial arts is still the same. Unarmored movement is still here. Um, you have a new feature called Mind Focus, where you can spend five minutes in meditation to regain a small number of key. Um...
uh, you regain key when you score a critical hit with a monk weapon or on arm strike, or you reduce um, it, like a creature to zero hit points. It should be hostile creature or score a critical hit against a hostile creature. That's that's probably something that is important to change. Um, monastic disciplines, yeah, you learn your disciplines. Key empowered strikes are still here. Evasion, improved key empowered strikes gives you um, extra force damage. Um, and yeah, I, I, also I moved Diamond Soul to the capstone because um, it's insane. Like it's a crazy ability. My fan is angled. The, is, is not angled right. Hang on, let me bring it a bit closer and uh, re readjust. But yeah, I made a bunch of new uh, monk subclasses. I adapted a lot of the old ones to just sort of fit the new key scaling. And uh, yeah, on on the whole, I'm I'm like I'm not going to go through all the subclasses because I'm going to be here for fucking ages. There's a million of them. There's ancient forms, um, ascendant dragon, astral self, broken mirror, cobalt soul, coiled serpent, drunken master, elements, iron body, kensai. Long Death, Mercy, Shadow, Sun Soul. Um, but the techniques and the disciplines I'll, I'll want to go through. Um, but Deflect Missiles is here, same as base. Flurry of Blows is here. Uh, guard Break, once on each of your turns, immediately after you hit a creature with an unarmed strike or monk weapon attack, you can spend a key point to break the target's defenses, briefly staggering them. The target makes a deck save, as it's uh, also has a negative two penalty to its AC. It, uh, it should be negative penalty to AC. Um, I feel like this effect is like kind of whatever, mostly just because like there's a deck save against it and it can just potentially just do nothing. Uh, whereas a lot of the other ones like always are good. So yeah, that's that's something I'll have to consider going in and changing. Intercepting fist. When a creature within five feet of you makes an attack roll, you can use your reaction to spend one key point to make one unarmed strike against that creature on a hit tux. The attack's normal effect and disadvantage on the triggering attack roll. No further attack rolls made against the same target until the start of its next turn. That's cool. Um, that's cool. Not sure how good it is, but it is cool. Key pulse, you can spend a key point to blast the to, to, to push them 15 feet away. If it collides with the solid object, it makes a strength signal falls prone. If it, it collides with another creature, it flies through that creature's space, potentially bowling it off its feet. The creature who whose space target was pushed through must make a deck save or fall prone. Huge or larger creatures gain the bunch on strength saving throws made against this feature. A tiny creature gains the bunch on dexterity saving throws made against this feature. So yeah. Like you, you, you punch. You know, it's that classic anime move where you, you, you punch a guy and he flies like forty meters across a fucking thing and he crashes into it. You know, makes a fucking crater in the wall. Patient defense is still here. Uh, pinpoint strike replaces stunning strike because stunning strike is, uh, is, is, is cancer. I, I hate stunning strike. It's, it's, it's just a bad ability. It's like it's a horrible ability that's unfun for DMs and players. Um, it's, it's either the DM, the DM is having fun, or the player is having, uh, the DM is having no fun, or the player is having no fun, and it's based entirely on whether it works or not. Because, pin, um, Stunning Strike in base is the only good ability the monks have, but also, if it works, your DM's cool boss is just dead. Like. It's just a feels bad. But Pinpoint Strike instead allows you to target stats instead of AC, just like, um... The um, Spirit of Hatred um, feature, except you can target Strength, uh, Dex, or Con, and they all do different things. Strength, the target can't make more than one weapon attack on its next turn, regardless of its abilities, traits, features, or magic items. Dexterity, the target speed is reduced to zero until the end of its next turn. And con, the target has disadvantage on Strength, Dex, and Con saving throws it makes until the end of its next turn. Creature immune to the exhaustion condition is equally immune to the effects of this feature, which I think is kind of weird. I don't know why that's necessarily like there but yeah. uh, soul focus is um oh that was one thing um open hand basically just got ripped apart and all of its features got turned into disciplines and techniques because way of the open hand is boring uh, and uninteresting so soul focus is their healing ability um wholeness of self um oh no 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 Whole this is wholeness of self no no i think i just stole the name and put it here a step of the wind sweeping strike um 
you can force them to make a strength dex or con save or fall prone, which I think is cool. You could you like if you know what their stats are, you can pick the one they're bad at. And the disciplines are things like you know, insightful mind, you can learn things about them. You got offensive stance or defensive stance. Defensive stance gives you basically like a ring of protection effect. And offensive stance gives you one d4 to the first attack you make on each turn. Uh, race of the wind, whenever you take a dash action, you move an additional 15 feet as a part of that action. Slip, whenever a creature misses you with an attack roll, you can immediately move up to 5 feet. Opportunity attacks made against you during this movement are made a disadvantage. So you can just you know, dip around. I think I think it's kind of fun. Um, slow fall, it's slow fall. Wholeness of self is when uh, you, yeah, you, um, it buffs, hit dice. Uh, and when you use mind focus, you can respect, you can spend a hit dice. And they, they also scale, like the, these are like invocations. Push positioning attack, and you hit a creature with five feet of them. Uh, you may attempt to push that creature as per the shove action as part of the same attack. Immediately to poison her disease. Uh, stillness of mind is just that monk feature. Tranquility is the the, the sanctuary thing that um, open hand has. Ascetic way. Um, instead of sleeping under a deep meditative state, remaining semi-conscious for one hour per day. After resting in this way, you gain the same benefits that original would from eight hours of sleep. Additionally, you no longer need to eat or drink to survive. I, I'm not a hundred percent. I might actually need to reword this because I think the meaning of this technically means that you can long rest in an hour, which is not good. I mean, technically, rules are written. You can only take one long rest every twenty-four hours, so it's like not that big of a deal. But it's still something I need to look at. Uh, precision style: the first time you suffer disadvantage on another strike or monk weapon attack on each of your turns, you instead do not suffer disadvantage. Shield of Will, when you finish a long rest, you gain a number of d4 equal to a wisdom roller. Yeah, roll d4 equal to a wisdom mod, you gain temporary points equal to the number rolled. And, uh, you must spend at least one hour of your long rest in deep meditation to gain this benefit. Tongue of Sun and Moon is here, and then these are the 17th level ones, they're all, like, silly. So, Battle Soul, whenever you roll initiative on less than three key points, you regain expended key points until you have three. Perfect discipline, during the first round of each combat, you have advantage on all attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws. Additionally, you cannot be surprised. And power strike is the first time you would roll, da roll damage for your improved key pound strikes. You roll a d, you do a d12 damage instead of a d4. This I still have yet to have someone test monk because it just so happens no one has played it in like the year and a half or so since I made this. Like I started a lot of campaigns too and just no one has played a monk. It's just like it's not that popular of a class to be fair, so it's not too surprising. But um, I can't really say whether it's super broken or not. I personally think it's probably fine, but even then, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I still, I still think the stuff I've done with this is cool. I'm, I'm happy with it for the most part. Um, yeah. Uh, up next is the smite spells. So I'm gonna open. I've got to find them. Oh, I'm in the, yeah, I'm in the wrong subfolder, that's why. Oh, he already went through the smite spells. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I literally did that earlier on. <clears throat> um, hmm. Inventory and survival. Is it in here? Yes. So this was a really interesting one because this was actually two streams and I got halfway through the second stream when I was like, you know what? I'm scrapping everything and starting again because what I had, I just wasn't happy with. I just was not happy with it at all. Um, even remotely, was just not happy with it. And I ended up scrapping everything. I was just going from the top. And I had inventory rules was the main thing, was what I scrapped. And the survival rules I, I kept. I went through and I reworked um, encumbrance, um, because I don't like how encumbrance, how punishing it is. I, I want it to be something you want to avoid, but not just like brutally punishing, like some fucking video game shit where you're like, oh, you're, you're, you're over encumbered, time to walk it like a fucking snail's pace or some bullshit. Uh, 
Um, I went through sort of food and drink, uh, and mostly foraging. That was one thing, was characters can gather food or water as the party travels at a normal, normal slow pace. A foraging character makes a wisdom survival check compared to the results of the abundant, to the abundance of resources in the area to determine the quantity of what they find. I have actually gone through and reworked this again, and I, I think, yeah, looking at this, a lot of this I changed again just because I was not happy with it. Turns out, making rules for exploration in 5e is fucking hard. It's hard, um, and it's complicated. Um, and what I ended up with in my, in my, in my, you know, for the home game that I'm starting relatively soon, hopefully, um, <laughs> been in the works for like two fucking years, better be starting soon. Um, but, you know, I, it was a really difficult thing to come up with and eventually I, I did manage to get it, but it took a long fucking time to get there. Um, that's really all I have to say about these, to be honest, but, um, yeah, sort of re recounting that, that sort of old story. Subclasses. This is an interesting one coming up because I'm not sure what version of this this is. Yeah. I scrapped this. This this vigilante, I scrapped it. Um, I I think I threw all of it in the bin. Because I just like Shadowed Persona I kept. But Vigilante's mark, eluding mark. I, yeah, I completely scrapped it. It turned Vigilante into, like, this team-based rogue, which seemed antithetical to, you know, a Vigilante. You know, sort of a Batman-style dude. Um, and, yeah, I threw all of this in the bin. Uh, I have someone playing a Vigilante uh, in uh, in the game I run on a Thursday at the moment. Um, I assume AJ is probably still here. I don't actually know. But, um, yeah, the version that she is playing is not even remotely similar to this. It works in a completely different way. It works with um, like rogues in my home game have strike techniques which are a little bit like barbarian battle outlets which we looked at before um, and it's built around those specifically. Um, that's what it does. So yeah, not really much to say about this because I threw all of it away um, because I wasn't happy with any of it. Which is appropriate for Vigilante. I've had I've had a strange relationship with the, with that concept as a class. So, next up is the Archive redesign, which is the Archive of Esoteric Secrets. It was my first book I ever put out on the guild. It was quite, it, well, I say quite, what well, was quite successful. Is, you know, it was a very successful product for me. Um, and I went through and I reworked a lot of stuff because I wasn't happy with it. I'm not going to go through literally all of it because it's like a hundred spells. We're going to be here forever. I ain't doing that shit. <laughs> I ain't doing it. Um, like, you know, that's, that's kind of how that be. I'm, I'm, uh, there's, there's another one with the repository redesign, which I did a few months ago. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go through that either. However, after that is the Paladin rework, which I am very intrigued to look at because I very much like that Paladin rework. I think it's, it, unlike the monk changes, it's not crazy complicated. It's not this huge, you know, fundamental change. It is taking the things the paladin does and making them a little more streamlined. Oh. So level one, you pick an oath. Simple as. You get lay on hands. Lay on hands is different. Lay on hands is a bonus action and you have a limit to how much you can heal someone at a time. Um, and if you target a creature with zero hit points, you, must, you have to do it as an action rather than as a bonus. Um... So, Divine Smite works with smite spells. When you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, you may cast a spell with a smite tag as part of the attack, affecting the target with the spell. So basically, it's you can just say, I always, oh, you know, I Divine Smite pre-cast Branding Smite, and you instantly cast Branding Smite and affect the target with it. Um, as opposed to the current Divine Smite, which encourages just not casting spells, and um, instead just using Divine Smite a bunch, which is boring. Um, Aura of Protection is nerfed slightly because it's insane. Um, Lay on Life um, is uh, just a buff to Lay on Hands. Um, Aura of Courage is also here as well. And then the subclasses give you actual features at level 1. Uh, they give you actual shit to do. 
For example, Oath of the Ancients gets Touch of Regrowth. Uh, whenever you restore hit points to one or more creatures with a spell or paladin feature, you can cause any number of those creatures to instead gain temporary hit points equal to half the amount of healing they would have received, which lasts until the end of their next turn. Whilst a creature has these temporary hit points, it gains resistance to all damage. So you can choose to give someone less um, healing and give it to them as temp, but while they have the temp, they'll probably take one attack and they'll take half damage, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm mostly just going to go through the first level features because they're the most relevant things that all of the subclasses get. Oath of Conquest gets overpowering strikes when you score a critical hit on an attack made against a creature. Uh, against a creature that creature suffers additional psychic damage equal to two plus your paladin level becomes framed of you until the end of your next turn. It's kind of minor, honestly. I like, kind of wish it was a little more interesting than that, to be perfectly honest, but I don't hate it at all. Oath of the Crown. Oath of the Crown I remember changing a lot just because it's really bad in base. I say really bad, it's just the worst paladin subclass. In the, it's just kind of the versus all the other ones, which are quite good. Whenever an allied creature you can see within 30 feet reduces a hostile creature to zero hit points, you gain temporary hit points equal to half your paladin level plus your con mod, which lasts until the end of that creature's next turn. It's kind of weird, but I like it. Uh, Oath of Devotion gives Hand of Devotion. Whenever you expend hit points from a lay, out a hand point, a lay on hands pool, the target gains temporary hit points equal to half the hit points expended, and they last until the end of your next turn. So yeah, it just makes lay on hands way better for you. Um, that makes combat healing almost good. Almost. Still still shit, but, you know, we can dream. <laughs> um, Oath of Freedom. Okay, this is weird. Okay. Um, Inspire Uprising. As an action on your turn, you can speak a call to action to a creature in 30 feet of you. If the creature can hear and understand you, it makes a wisdom saving against your spell safety. See, and a failure, it is charmed by you. If it was hostile, hostile to you, it is charmed until the end of your next turn. If it was not hostile to you, it is charmed for one hour, or until one of your allies take a harmful action against a creature allied to it. The creature ends early if you or your allies take a harmful action against that against the creature, or your orders to the creature would be obviously suicidal, such as pitting themselves onto a pit of spikes or asking a single young or asking a, a single young commoner to attack a pit fiend. <laughs> A creature charmed by you in this way is your ally and follows your spoken orders, which you give as a part of your action to use this feature. Additionally, a creature that fails at saving throw has as the words you speak burned into its mind. The creature remembers your words to the letter and is deeply moved by them in a way the manner the DM chooses. This is a weird ability. This is kind of crazy for first level, to be honest. I'm not super big on it, it's because it's really fucking strong. Oh, there's a sidebar for this. <laughs> I forgot how ridiculous this ability is. Uh, at the beginning of combat, you may choose to lead the charge. If you do, after each non-allied creature has rolled an initiative, you may choose the result of each allied creature's initiative roll. At the beginning of your second roll of combat, each event, I must re-roll initiative. So, first the DM rolls initiative for the enemies. Some ogres who get a 6, some orcs who get a 16, and their evil mage leader who gets a 13. Let's say the paladin has three allies, the, uh, a wizard, a rogue, and a friendly NPC. The paladin then chooses the initiative for, the, for these allies, giving themselves a 17, the rogue a 25, the wizard a 12, and the NPC a 15. The initiative was go as follows, the rogue, the paladin, the orcs, the NPC ally, the evil mage, the wizard, and, and the ogres. At the beginning of the second round, the paladin and the allies must, must roll initiative, shuffling themselves into the initial order alongside their enemies. The paladin gets a, gets a 10, the rogue gets a 20, the wizard gets a 12, and the NPC gets a 5. The new initiative is as follows, the rogue, the orcs, the evil mage, the wizard, the paladin, the ogres, and finally the NPC ally. So basically, at the start of combat, you can say, all my allies go first, or whatever. Oath of Glory. Whenever you reduce a creature to zero hit points or score a critical hit, you may immediately move up to 20 feet and may then make a weapon attack against a creature within your weapon's reach. That is really fucking strong. That's really good. Which does help, because Glorious, because uh, Oath of Glory is kind of bad in base. Um, Oath of the Reaper. Whenever you score a critical hit against a creature, you can mark it for death. At the beginning of each uh, of each of the marked creatures turns to the next minute, it reduces the current hit points but and hit point maximum by an amount equal to your paladin level. At the end of each of its turns, it can make a charisma save. As that's the mark ends, a creature whose hit point maximum is zero by this feature dies. Cool. Kind of interesting. Oath of Redemption gets Redeemer's Touch. Um, you gain a second pool of hit points for your Lay on Hands feature called your Redeemer's Pool, which has five hit points. Redeemer's Pool is replenished from it. Oh, it just gives you a second Lay on Hands with slightly less hit points in it. That's cool. I like that. Um, Oath of the Scroll. 
creatures you lay on Arcana. As an action on your turn, you can touch a creature and choose a spell level at first or lower. You must... Oh, okay, no, I, it's, I know why it's worded like that, okay. You must then expend hit points from your lay on hand pulls equal to five times the chosen level. To do so, target gains an additional spell slot. The chosen level shall last until that creature's next completes a long rest. The highest level of spell slot... So yeah, you can grant people higher level higher level spell slots once you've grant a creature an additional spell slot with this feature. You cannot grant that feature another spell slot until the next completes a long rest. That's cool. I like that. That's fun. Oath of Steel. Iron Assault. Whenever you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you use your bonus action to grant a creature you choose a plus two bonus to its AC until the start of your next turn. There, there, there should be a range on that. Let me go make sure that that is... Let me go make sure that I actually put a range on that in the end, because that's crazy. Yeah, um, Oath of Steel and Oath of the Scroll are like new ones, but I'm not going to spend a bunch of time going through them, because I, like, I'm, I'm in a position where I don't, I don't want to be here for like forever, um, streaming today, because like, I'm like, I'm having fun going through old stuff, but also, I'm well aware of the fact that we have been going for two hours already, and like, I'm only like halfway through my list of things. Um. Okay, yeah, I did. I did remember to give it an actual fucking range. Good. Oath of Treachery is my favourite, because the 20th level ability starts with you are invisible, and that makes me happy. <laughs> uh, Cull the Herd. You gain advantage on melee, melee attack rolls against any creature that is one or more allies within five feet of it, or you. It's fun. I like that. Valor. Uh, Valor is another one of mine. Brilliant offensive. Once each turn, whenever you make a melee weapon attack, you can choose to gain advantage on the roll. On a hit, you gain temporary hit points equal to your charisma modifier plus your paladin level, which lasts until the start of your next turn. Cool. Oath of Vengeance, Lay on Brands. As a bonus action on your turn, you can spend a number of hit points from your Lay on hand pulls equal to your charisma modifier plus your paladin level. Or the amount remaining in your pool, whichever is lower. Equal to? Why is it not up to? Whatever. Make a melee spell attack against a creature you can touch on a hit target to bring damage equal to the pool points expended from the pool. I should be up to, really, but, yeah. Watchers, harness the realms. As a bonus action, you teleport up to 15 feet to an object plus 15. See, upon reappearing, you're empowered by one of the following damage types. That's called fire, lightning, or poison. Next person, weapon, tank, move within the next turn, deals an additional damage uh, of the chosen type equal to 94 plus half your power level. Cool. You can do it once per short long rest, you can do it more later on. That's fun. I like that. Those are all the subclasses. I'm, again, not really had anyone test new paladin. It's, it's kind of happened. It's kind of be like that sometimes. I do like it, though. I think it's cool. I'm generally pretty happy with it. Whew. I'm going to take a break there, because I really need a drink. Um, setting out of milk, so I can't... Ugh. I can't go make more coffee, even though I very much need it. Um, but... That one. Um, up next, we will be looking at the community made magic item. So I'm, I'm actually going to go open that up. And. Um, oh no, oh no it's, it's in the stream spells document. I, I put it in there. Because a lot of these magic items actually made it into um, the repository of arcane oddities. Uh, the second one. Uh, which I put out at the start of this year and did, it did okay. I believe, I believe it's copper. Oh, no, 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 the first, the first one went copper around the time that the second one, or because when the second one came out, that's why. The, the second one is not copper. I think. The repository is copper, the second one... is not. Okay. Um, but yeah. I'm gonna take a quick break here because I really need a drink. I'll be back in like five minutes tops. Yeah, see you in a minute.
Hey folks, I'm back. So thank you very much for the raid, it's much appreciated. I'm currently going through basically all the stuff I've made on stream over the past um, couple um, like couple years. Uh, oh, the, it decided not to... Uh, oh, no. Yeah, there we go. It does not like this file. I don't know why. That's really strange. Hang on. Let me do it this way. There we go. Okay, right. So I went through all the spells. Uh, I was going to go through some of the magic items because some of the, some of these were um, were community suggestions. That much I remember. I could not tell you which ones though. <laughs> it's been a while. But um, yeah, say so these. A lot of these made it into the repository of arcane oddities. Um, which is my magic item, the, the second one specifically, it's my magic item book I put out earlier on this year. Um, the amulet spell expanding has three charges, you can make your AoE spells bigger. Um, the arcane blueprints, they are blueprints for making magic items, which is kind of neat. The arsonist tinderbox is a common item, you can set things on fire with it. <laughs> um, I don't remember, what is the belt of rock skin? While you wear this magical belt, you gain the benefits of the stone skin spell. Okay, that's very good. Additionally, when you would take damage while wearing this belt, you can use your reaction to encase yourself in a rocky shell until the start of the next turn. While encasing this way, you gain the following. You're affected in the following ways. You are incapacitated and you can't move or speak. Attack rolls against you have advantage. You have automatically spell dex. <laughs> strength and dexterity saving throws. You're risen to all damage and you're immune to poison and disease. Although poison and disease already in your system is suspended, not neutralized. So. Um. I guess this is very specifically like I'm about to be hit with like disintegrate or delayed or like delayed blast fireball or something. I'm about to take like a hundred damage and I need to not take that right now. Uh, this is a really strong magic item though. <laughs> uh, the cloak of shattering, glass of sock silk, soft, soft silks. Words are hard. Uh, adorned with diamond-shaped stained glass shards in intricate patterns. Uh, this magical cloak makes a pleasant tinkling sound as it moves like quiet wind chimes. As an action, you can speed the cloak's command word and cause it, the glass upon it to violently shatter, sending gla uh, shards out. And either a 20-foot cone centered on you or a 10-foot radius around you, your choice. Each creature in the area makes a deck save. They take slashing and thunder damage. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Until the next dawn, whereupon the glass reforms in the sun's morning rays. The compact car. I remember this thing. This, uh, it's a six inch tall magical miniature, it's a it shows a delightful carriage styled akin to a stagecoach or Vardo being pulled by a pair of draft horses. You may speak the cart's command word as an action on your turn. It, if the miniature is on solid ground, it transforms into a fully sized carriage with a pair of living draft horses. The horses are considered constructs as opposed to beasts and require no feed or water um, or water to persist. I, that would not, that didn't make it into the final one, so that's all good. But otherwise act as a, as a normal horse would. If either of the horses die, the carriage immediately shrinks back down, and speaking its command word again has no effect until the next horn, upon which a new miniature horse, different to the last, appears hitched on the hitched to the miniature. Upon speaking the command word again, the carriage and horses, alongside any object inside of it, shrink back down, becoming inert miniatures once more, whilst any creatures inside the carriage are expelled into an, into the open spaces nearest to the entrance. I really like this this item. I think it's fun. Uh, the deck of many quests. Um, so the completed version isn't on this document, it is it is on a different one elsewhere, um, but it sends you on quests, and if you come back, um, I believe... Oh no, no, it straight up just imparts them with a quest. Um, and if you do the quests, you'll probably get rewards, maybe you won't. But yeah, it's 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 the same sort of feel of the deck of many things, but without any of the game ruining bullshit that tends to come with it, uh, which I think is nice. Uh, divine ammunition, uh, it does no damage, but heals things, so you can shoot a guy and uh, and heal them. Uh, the duelist wand, um, can, this wand can be wielded as a magical rapier and grants a plus one bonus to attacking damage while made with it. Whilst holding it, you gain a plus one bonus to your to your AC and spell attack roll. Additionally, the wand has three charges. You can spend it to cast shield. This wand, this, this is crazy strong. That's so good. That's a blade singer's dream right there. Holy shit. 
Uh, so, oh, yeah, I forgot we made some tattoos. Yeah, uh, empowering tattoo. Uh, while there's tattoos on your skin, you get plus two to a stat. Um, and, and, and it can increase you to 22 as well, which is cool. Um, eye patch of night. Um, you have dark vision. Whilst uh, the eye patch greatly inhibits depth of perception while wearing the eye patch, just focus on dexterity ability checks. Um, attuning to eyeball curses you into the target by the remove curse or similar magic. Whilst cursed, the eye, the eye patch cannot be taken off, adjusted, or moved in any way, short of tearing your eyeball out in the process. Uh, the Fate Stealer's Needle. Magically carved a hand of a long broken clock. This magical clock hand allows you to steal the time of others in a pinch. Whilst the needle is on your person, after you roll initiative, but before the first creature is taken its turn in combat, you may choose a creature that you can see within 60 feet if you can swap initiative results with that creature. I really like the, the this is a it's a fun it's a fun magic item. Um, it maybe it's very strong though. Um, it's very very strong. Uh, the Fate Weaver's sword spear is um, is the is Angela's uh, is Angela's um, sword spear. Um, it's uh, it's a plus three. Um, yeah, crits on nineteen to twenty does extra uh, radiant damage. It's has um, when you score a critical hit with the pike, you can immediately make one weapon, additional attack with a, with a weapon against a creature within its reach, like uh, woven reality. Um, it, oh, it gives you it literally gives you three luck points as well. Um, so yeah, it is um, it, it is Angela's spear for, from Angela's Deific Dictionary, Angela's Mortal Manual. Uh, Phasey shield. Gives you plus AC. Oh, it's, it's a plus two shield. Uh, when you would be hit by an attack, use normal to charges to instead cause the attack to miss you. That is crazy. <laughs> so good. Uh, the Feywild brand tattoo gives you uh, advantage on saves against charmed condition and magic can't put. Oh, it literally gives you um, Fey ancestry. As a bonus action, you can have your tattoo surround you in a glowing fey light, granting your flying speed equal to twice your walking speed until the end of your next turn. Once you have this flying speed, you can hover and you don't provoke opportunity attacks when flying out of enemy uh, out of an enemy's reach. And you can do it once per day. That's fun. I like that. Ooh, the Frostfire Gauntlets. I remember these things. These magical gauntlets are each wreathed in 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 one of the elements of their namesake, one of ice and one of flame. The left gauntlet, the ice gauntlet, begins with one charge, whilst the right gauntlet, the flame gauntlet, begins with no charges. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, if one if one gauntlet has a charge, that charge is expended and the opposite gauntlet then gains a charge. Whenever charges are expended from the gauntlet, it invokes an effect based on the gauntlet the charge was expended from, as shown below. So basically, you it's 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 very difficult to word like how that works in 5e because you have to like sort of flip charges around like it's really strange but it's basically a one two you know like you do you do the ice effect then you do the fire effect the ice effect fire effect so on so forth that not um so the uh, ice gauntlet does cold damage and reduces the speed the fire gauntlet just does damage like it's, it's it's a very simple magic item but i think it's really cool uh the gambler's charms i really like the gambler's charms um, when a creature you can see within 6 feet would make an attack roll saving throw, you can use, your, use your reaction and roll 2d6. If the result of both d6s is a 6, esoteric magic intervenes and the creature's attack roll hits automatically, or its saving throw is a success. And once, yeah, you can only do that. Once, once you succeed, you can't do it again. And, uh, Snake Eyes is, um, you can, if you roll two ones, you can force them to fail. I really like the Gambler's Charms. They're really stupid. <laughs> Um, because the actual likelihood of rolling two ones is, or two sixes, is pretty low. It's like one in 36 or something. I forget specifically what it is. It's two point, you, you have like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a 2% chance. Or, well, it's, it's a 2.78% chance, so it's round to three. Yeah, it's kind of silly, but I like it. <laughs> There's the Grand Weave tattoo. Um, whenever you can't expend a spell slot first level higher, you may expend a charge to, to treat the expended spells spell slot as if it were one level higher. 
as a bonus action, you can expend any number of the ta uh, tattoos charges regaining an expended spell slot of a level equal to the charges expended. You can't regain a spell slot of 6th level or higher with this feature. It should be trait. It should be a trait. Oh, I've got an ache in my knuckle or something. Yeah. Oh. There's the Helm of Hatred. When a creature within 10 feet of you misses with attack roll, that creature just straight up takes psychic damage. There's Hydra Lash. Um, it's a whip. And... Um, you can extend its whip out, extend its reach out to 30 feet. Wow, well, it's extended its way hitting a creature from the attack, causes the whip to retract back to its original size and pull the creature to nearest unoccupied space within 10 feet of you. Oh, is it an action to extend it? That feels like a misstep. It should definitely be a bonus. Huge or larger creatures can make it to strength saving throw resist being pulled by the whip. When you when you first extend the whip, you must immediately make. Oh, right, okay, you may immediately make one attack roll as part of the same thing. That Okay, that's fine. There's the Eldros Spoons. Now, what spell? It gives you... It gives you cure wounds, create food and water, and thunder wave. That's that's fun. There's the Malabranca's Pitchfork. Um, you can do extra... Yeah, it is... I, honestly, this thing's kind of boring. It's just a trident that does extra fire damage. Oh, and poisons them, I guess. There's uh, Nero's Gatling Refractor, which I love. The staff itself is a is crafted from iron and wood, forming a, a hollow cylinder some six inches across. As an action on your turn, you lose six bolts of light from the hollow end of the staff, re uh, refracting them through the crystals, creating a variety of effects. You may fire each bolt at one target or split them on seven and make a spell attack for each bolt. Plus seven to hit, or using your spell casting ability for a mod blah, 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 spell casting ability modifier, whichever is higher. On a hit, roll a d6 to determine which colored crystal affects the target. So yeah, they all do different things. Um, that's all. It's like a prismatic effect. Um, Knight's Veil. When you stand within dim light or darkness, you are invisible and gain a 10 foot bonus to speed. That's fun. Potion of Dispelling. Oh, this is fun. When you drink this potion, you are affected by the Dispel Magic spell as if cast at 5th level. This potion has no effect on spells of 6th level or higher. The sparkling purple liquid is almost is almost jam-like and consistently in tastes of onions and vinegar. Uh, when you drink this potion, um, you are affected by the... Yeah, the, the greater dispelling is just... It just dispels all magic, all spells on you. Potion of Transformation... This, uh, this new form can either be a specific humanoid creature you're familiar with, or another type of creature or child dragon. Acts as per the creature into creature aspect of the true polymorph spell and lasts for one hour. The potion is a silvery mercury like mercury like liquid filled with crushed pieces of caterpillar cocoon that shine a, a constantly shifting array of colours. The purse of coinage is a bag of holding just for money. That's that's like it's, it's a whole lot of text to describe exactly what I just said. The roaring reads uh, deafens creatures. Uh, and incapacitates them. The sanative spores um, are actually really, really strong. They're one, they're a one use item that you can put on someone, and they regain hit points and stop each of their turns, uh, which is very powerful if you know what you're doing. Siege ammunition. When you make an attack roll with this uh, with this magical ammunition, it triples in size. You roll two additional weapon damage dice for attacks made with this magical ammunition. Additionally, attacks made with this magical ammunition. Should deal double damage to objects and structures. When you fire the piece of ammunition, it becomes non-magical ammunition and suit becomes a, it becomes a non-magical piece of ammunition suitable for use of a part of an appropriate siege weapon. <laughs> um, Staff of Great Oaks. As an action point stuff towards a cre tree you can see with 120 feet for you, the tree animates as an awakened tree with the following alterations. It has AC 15, has walking speed of 30 feet, can't speak. Its uh, attack bonus is equal to... Uh, is equal to four plus your proficiency bonus. The tree is friendly to you and your companions, follows your spoken commands, yada yada yada. Once you've animated a tree, yeah, it goes away. Um, it's sentient. Uh, it has the, the the visage of a, it has the 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 the, the mind of a tree. And staff of halting. Whenever a creature enters the space and 20 feet, you can spend a chance. Uh, you spend you spend a chance as a reaction to slam the stuff on the ground, sending out wave force from its most strength. Same thing, it's 20 feet away from you and fall prone. Alternatively, you spend two, two, two of the stars charges as an action to slam the stuff into a ground with even greater energy, sending out a shock force you to each creature in 20 feet of you to make a strength saving throw, which was 40 feet away from you and not prone. That's fun. 
the tape of swift repair. <laughs> I, every time I open this, I forget that these fucking images are here. Oh, <laughs> uh, I always forget. Like, I even just sort of, I'm, I'm, at, a, I'm at a point where, where I, I have really terrible, like, object permanence. When something is like out of, or when when things and concepts are like out of my vision, I just forget that they exist. So I always forget that Phil Swift is here, like he's you know over on the other side of the screen. I always just forget that he's there. It's it's sort of like I'm so used to him that my eyes just kind of glaze over his presence, and I just don't I don't register it. But I always forget that this, this fucking image every time I scroll down in this document. And I've opened this document a lot on stream and had this exact experience many times, just forgetting. That Phil Swift is here, and there was there was a fantastic clip buried somewhere in Twitch about of me uh, reading the Phil Swift Wikipedia page and it, me absolutely fucking dying. It's it's great. It's from really early on too. It was from like from a, it was you know it was from my first few months of streaming. It was really funny. Um, but yeah, the the tape of Swift repair allows you to. Um, repair objects by tearing off lengths of the tape. That's uh, 50, uh, 30 feet of... It's flex tape. It's... It's flex tape. I think someone someone memed uh, about making flex tape as a magic item, and so I made flex tape as a magic item. Flex tape. The super strong waterproof tape that can patch, bond, seal, and repair. Oh... <laughs> the Tome of Grand Hymns allows you to permanently learn spells as a cleric and paladin. It's basically how it works. I'm not going to go reading through all of it. The Wand of Misty Leaps allows you to um, use an action and teleport uh, 120 feet. It's it's basically baby's first um, dimensional. And it's also the Wild Wand, which is a Wand of the War Mage, but it also... Whenever you cast a spell using the wand, you potentially wild magic search, which I think is just really fun. Um, that is, those are all the magic items we've made on stream, which is surprisingly less than I thought. But there's a lot of stuff here I'm very happy with. There's very few things I look at and I'm go, um, like basically all of it is like, you know, like a solid thumbs up or something like the tape of swift repair, which I absolutely adore, and not just because Phil Swift is here with the knife. Um. Yeah, I just, I really like it. Uh, next up are the subclasses that I made on stream for Dritz's Travelogue of Everything, which came out a few months ago. It's a big compendium book, you can get it on the guild. It's done quite well on the guild, in fact. Um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very popular book. Um, it's very good. It's very, very good. Uh, the, the stuff I made in it, I'm very, very proud of. I'm, I'm going to go find the stuff. I made three subclasses. I made the Fae Touched Sorcerer, the Emissary Ranger, and the Mechanic Barbarian. Oh no, four. There's, uh, there's also um, Revelry Barbarian, which at the time was called Euphoria Barbarian, but has since been renamed uh, for, the, for the official release. Let's go find those. Fae Touch. I think Fae Touch got renamed to something else as well. I don't remember what. Um, but basically, what this did. Uh, ig uh, ignore this. This is uh, this is for my home game because sorcerers get things at 14th level in my home game. Wait, no, 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 no. Ignore me. Oh, I know what I did. I changed this for something else in the official release. They summon plants in the official release. More, more plants. Oh shit! Thank you very much for the raid. It was very much appreciated. Damn. Hang on. Uh, do any of my do any of my commands work? Um, God, I, don't, I don't even know what. Um, I say yeah, thank you very much. I've been I've been going through all the stuff I've been designing for um, for five e over the past couple of years. Um, going through, I'm I'm, I'm about like two thirds of the way through at this point. I'm sort of going through the uh, Fey Touch Sorcerer. This is like this is like the first draft document, the 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 original, like the final cut of Fey Touch. Ended up being not different. Um, the the fourteenth level feature got changed for something else, and the name got changed as well because of the Fey Touch feat, which I forgot existed at the time. 
Um, but yeah, you basically you make grass. You you summon magic fey grass and you can hide in it. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you take a hide action as a bonus action. Eventually, it heavily obscures them. Uh, oh no, I think. I, I can't remember. I, th I think things got shifted around a little bit. It, there was a lot of back and forth about like exactly how to balance wild growth because it's really strong. Um, but yeah, you, you basically fill three adjacent spaces with with like heavily obscuring like grass that you can hide in, um, which I really really like. Uh, Veil of the Twin Courts is um, it gives them half cover. Um, and they can see through it as if it wasn't heavily obscured, which I think is really fun. Um, and... Da -da 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 -da. Oh, they become invisible. That's that's what happens. Uh, the 14th level feature, I scrapped this fairy shape ability because it was kind of boring. And instead they summon three different plants, which either poison, I think difficult terrain, I forget what the other one does off the top of my head. And wild sublimity allows them to uh, create an area of mirage arcane. Uh, which I like. I think Mirage Arcane is cool. Um, Fate, Fate Touch I am really happy with, mostly just because Wild Growth. A lot of... 5e doesn't have that much of, like, battlefield affecting abilities. There's very, very little of it. Um, and what there is is mostly kind of shit. Um, so having stuff that, you know, lets people play with the battlefield and really think about, you know... I, I, know, I know the reason they don't have it is because they're like, oh, some people play 5e Theatre of the Mind. It's like, the number of people that do that is negligible, I find. Like, everybody wants to play on a grid because why would you not want to play on a grid? There's a lot of things you miss out on by not, and a lot of things that become much more complicated by not, for no reason. So, um, yeah, I think um, like more battlefield affecting stuff is just good for the game because 99% of people play on grid, um, and like, yeah, I don't know. That's 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 the best kind of attitude I have towards it anyway. But I really like um, this this sorcerer. I, I think I think it's fun. Uh, what was the second one? Emissary Ranger. Em em emissary is also very cool. I ended up changing. I think on the the editor's suggestion, I ended up changing the spells they get to be more appropriate. Um, like instead of just giving them good cleric spells, I gave them a good you know, message sending spells, and the main thing that they get is they get a few spells, and then they can also prepare a few cleric spells every day, um, which is really fucking strong. Um, holy message, they can literally deliver a message by you know, shooting you in the face, uh, which does extra radiant damage, which I think is kind of fun. Uh, radiant word, they can, um, I think I scrapped, I scrapped one of these, I assume probably this one, I don't remember specifically. But it debuffs them in, in some capacity. Um, or Warding Word, which wards creatures, is, is when you when you use Holy Message. Um, and you can use it a few times. Holy Command allows you to cast Command. Um, and you can expend uses of Radiant Word to cast Command as a bonus action, which I just think is really fun. Um, and you also gain benefits of like being able to communicate with creatures. At a 15th, you give people bonuses to saving throws, which I thought was a bit of a non sequitur, and even looking back at it as something I was like, if I if I if I thought of anything else, I definitely would have changed it, but I don't I don't hate Divine Preacher, it just feels a bit of a non sequitur compared to you know, it's like, oh, everybody gets a bonus to saves. It's like it's kind of whatever. But I do like the subclass a lot. I think Holy Message is cool, the theme is cool. Being able to prepare cleric spells as a ranger, you know, just a ranger with healing word, like it's pretty good. <laughs> Um, so the next, the, 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 ne the next one is, is another, oh, hang on, oh shit, it didn't, I, I didn't, I, I, I fucked it up, hang on, yeah, open emissary so you can actually fucking see it, there we go, so yeah, you can see, I changed these spells for, like, I kept sending, but instead they get, like, comprehend languages and, um, and Liam and secret chest and shit like that, and they get to prepare. Um, cleric, spells, cleric spells equal to one third their ranger level. Um, Holy Message uh, does a little bit of radiant damage. They can do, I believe I kept these three. I assume the fact that I've highlighted this in red means I scrap this one, but I'm not 
100% which one I scrapped, I can't remember. I wanted to have three because it's neater than having four, basically. Holy Command, yeah, they, they get Command, they can spend stuff to cast it as a bonus, which, you know, Command is a good spell, casting it as a bonus is good. Um, and then, yeah, they get their Divine Preacher ability. The next one went through a lot of revisions. Uh, mechanic. So, Mechanic, you get your Arcane Ride which I ended up having to change it quite a bit because there was a lot of thing, a lot of confusion about like, is it an object? Is it a buff to you? Like, how does it work? And in the end, we ended up defining it as an object, which was very difficult, but we, ended, we, we, we got there in the end. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we managed to get all the me mechanical tinkering things where you you have, you know, here, here is the art that is in the book. It's sick as fuck. It's um, um, like, 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 like Peter V did like, a fantastic job with this art. I think it's really good. <laughs> I mean, just look at it. Like, it's so good. Um, you have your arcane ride. It, you know, it doesn't have to be a motorcycle. It can be rocket boots. It can be a mechanical horse. Uh, it can be whatever. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can have crew. You can get combat drifting. You can get grav magnets to go upside down on ceilings. You can create a shield. You can shoot micro missiles. You can have an oil slick. Um, ramming speed, you can get a slipstream, you can have spell nitro, submersible, you can have, have it be a submersible. Uh, you can sort of mix and match, you can, you can basically pimp your arcane ride. You can do arcane stunts, um, which gives you bonuses to speed and your jump distance and stuff, and eventually your arcane ride can of course fly, because that's cool, that's fun, why wouldn't you be able to do that? Um, I really like... <laughs> The, uh, the mechanic. Uh, it, it went through a lot of painstaking sort of reiteration to get the abilities to work, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. This isn't the final version. This is, uh, this is like version 2, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is. Uh, I'm very, very happy with how this sort of came out. I think it's, I think it's cool as hell. Um, and the final one for Dritz, as I did, was Euphoria Barbarian, which eventually got renamed to Revelry because it made more sense. But basically, when someone damages you, you damage them back, or you, you do extra damage to them on your next attack. Um, Adrenaline Rush, you can move up to half your speed towards creatures a few times per day. Um, Brash Taunter, you can taunt people into coming closer to you. Um, uh, they have disadvantage on attack rolls made against creatures other than you, and they have to spend two feet of movement for every movement they make in a direction that isn't towards you. So they're like, come at me, bro, or stay the fuck where you are, uh, which I love. Uh, Euphoric Revelry, you can you can adrenaline rush as much as you want. And whenever you enter a space within five feet of another creature, if you've not already hit that creature with a weapon attack this turn, you can make a melee weapon attack against that creature. So you basically just run around. We had to nerf this because I was like, okay, yeah, if you move fast enough, technically you could, you know, if there's enough creatures in, in an area, you could technically attack like a hundred creatures in a turn, which is maybe a little too good. So we ended up limiting it to like some number. I can't remember. I think it was like, like five or six or something. But you can, you know, run around in a circle and slam five dudes in the face. And it's pretty fun. Um... I, I, I've actually had someone play Path of Euphoria. Sadly, it was in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, you know, the campaign with like, like zero mandatory combats. Uh, so we didn't, it didn't really get to shine all that much. Um, but the few times like you know, Battle Bliss was triggered and things like that, it, it seemed good fun. I think it was in an okay spot. I feel like Battle Bliss is like a little underpowered, honestly. Um, but I do, st I do still like the subclass on principle. It's you know, like this flavor text is most barbarians channel pure rage and hatred into their strikes, driving them forth in battle through rivers of blood and enemies. To those of the part, to uh, those of the path of euphoria, have no time to get angry. Why would they? Fighting is fun. It's like that's that's sort of the vibe, um, and it's it's you know a, a barbarian that just likes fighting. You know they, they just have they, they, you know they they don't rage. They just you know, their, their rage is them just having fun, which is cool. I like that. Um, okay, right. We are nearing the end. We're sort of catching up to things I've actually done in the past, like, six months. Um, because next up is the Mystic. 
which was, I think, the weirdest thing I've ever done. Because I made a mystic. And it is weird. <laughs> um, so yeah. The mystic, the way that it works, is I, I'm not going to go through all of it because this... Um, oh, thank you very much for the follow. Much appreciated. Um, this a word document is 28 pages long. Uh, but the way Mystic works, my Mystic that I made, is you have psionic power and you learn powers. You, you have talent points, you get talent points as you level up. Um, and whenever you gain a level or whenever you complete a long rest, you can spend one of your talent points to learn a power permanently. And you can sort of, you know, you can unlearn powers and things like that. Um, and as you gain levels, you gain the ability to level up your powers, to increase your mastery of a power. As, um, yeah, strengthening power. Um, oh, here we go. Powers come in four levels of mastery. Novice, Adept, Expert, and Master. Um, at higher levels, you gain the ability to strengthen powers you know. Whenever you would spend talent points, you may spend them to strengthen powers you know, increasing the chosen powers by one mastery level for each talent point expended um, to strengthen that power up to your current maximum mastery. Basically, to start with, you can learn two powers. Um, you learn them at the novice level, and by at third level, or at second level, you get another talent point, so you can learn another power. And at third, you gain psionic adept, which allows you to... Um, level up your pre-existing powers to adept. So the, the real sort of kicker here is that this class has no subclasses. There, there is no, you know, you don't get to pick a subclass at first, second, or third. All of the powers are trees of abilities that you can level up. So let me let me go find, like, probably the... the let's go find, like, a simple example. Um, levitation, sure. So uh, they come in different disciplines, which aren't super relevant. They ended up being they they were they were they're sort of a holdover from a very early version where the disciplines actually really mattered, but they're all just groupings. Um, so levitation, you can defy gravity, or, defy gravity, lifting yourself and others with psionics. So at novice level, you gain hovering avoidance and psionic leap. Whenever you are hit with a weapon attack or fail a dexterity saving throw from a source you can see, you can use your reaction and halve any damage from the source of that attack or saving throw. You can do that a number. You can do that once. Um, psionic leap, uh, your long jump is 20 feet and your high jump is 10 feet with or without a running start. So if you learn if you learn levitation at level one uh, or, or you learn it as a novice, that's what you get. Later on, if you choose to spend a talent point to level it up to adept, um, you uh, can use hovering avoidance three times. Um, you psionic leap is better. Your long jump is 40 feet and your high jump is 30, which is very strong. Um, and you gain Lesser Levitation, which grants you the ability to cast Levitate uh, once per short long rest. Um, e uh, once you level it up to Expert, which I believe you gain access to at 10th level, is it? 9th level, 9th level, close enough. Um, you can use uh, Hovering Avoidance at will. You can, you can use it you know, as long as you have your reaction. Uh, lesser Levitation is you can, you, know, you can cast Levitate three times. And you also gain psion uh, uh, your psionic leap becomes better. Your you know, your long jump and high jump are both sixty feet, which you know means if you dash, you can you know you can just spring to basically wherever you want. And at master, um, you gain greater levitation. You gain a flying speed of sixty feet, and you can hop. Um, so yeah, you really have to sort of spec all the way into having a flying speed. Um, uh, other things, you know, sort of, let me, let me sort of go through another one for the same sort of feel. But basically, this, this is your whole class. Like, there's very little that, um, you know, like, mystics don't really, you know, they get they get psychic blast, which is just a generic means of doing damage. Um, at fifth level, they can use, um, uh, you can you can sort of, you, your psychic blast becomes more flexible. Uh, at sixth level, you gain. Um, very minor sort of fluff effects. Um, at tenth, you get resistance to psychic damage, and your uh, mental scores can't be reduced. Uh, at fourteenth, uh, you get ageless mind, and at eighteenth, you get to cast one ninth level spell once per day, um, which is you know, you get you can pick blade of disaster, foresight, gate, gate invulnerability, psychic screen, you know, like 
uh, and then unfathomable, in, unfathomable intellect words, you just get plus four in, and um, you basically automatically succeed on intelligence save, uh, on intelligence checks and saves because you get super reliable talent. Like, like the whole class gives you that, uh, or the base class. Everything else is just in the powers, and there are this many powers. <laughs> There's a lot. Is, uh, is is the 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 key, the key takeaway there is that there is quite a few of them. Um, obviously, the actual number of powers. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. There is twenty-five powers. There are five disciplines, five powers for each, um, and you. Uh, the, the disciplines are just like schools. They're not really relevant mechanically most of the time. Um, but yeah, that is. Um, That is sort of the way that this this sort of subclass, this subclass, this class works. Is it's a very it's I think it's it's a more unique take on the mystic that I've seen personally. I've not seen one quite like this. I've seen sort of adjacent things, like you know, like the fact that you have disciplines or powers or whatever they want to be called that get better as you level up is is you know, pretty common for mystics. But that get better in this sort of dynamic way. You can build you can build mystic a million different ways. And I'm in a position where I don't know how easy it is to build it wrong and build a character that's complete dog shit. <laughs> that's the, my main concern, is it's probably very, very easy to build a character that is just bad. Like, it's just explicitly just terrible. Um, I think it is probably scarily very easy to do that by accident. Um, and that does concern me. And I've yet to have someone test it yet, so, you know. It's it's a it's a proof of concept I think and uh, I'm I'm very happy with it I like it a lot I think it's really cool. However, it's definitely in a weird spot because it could. There's definitely abilities in here that are undoubtedly super broken. Um, just yeah, it's just the nature of the beast, right? And kind of it's unavoidable. But there's also an equal possibility that the class is just bad. <laughs> like it's it's just bad. Um, so I don't know. So, I'm gonna, oh, apparently I made changes, I guess I'll save them. Um, so, other things... ...was I made exclusive spells for Artificers and Paladins. I also did it for all of the other classes as well, but I didn't do those on stream. Um, so, Artificer gets, like, Cherry Bomb as a cantrip. Um, yeah, there's fire damage. Um, an impact with a creature or object that's fit detonates, creating a loud sound that can be heard from up to 100 feet. It blows up. It, if it misses an, ally, an enemy, it hits an object and explodes. Um, arcane charge is. Um, I think I, I think I changed this to just arcane charge. I think, where um, you until the end of your next turn, you, your speed increases, and uh, you can use an action to end the spell early and do lightning damage to a dude, which I think is fun. Uh, I, I remember changing it a bit before I put it in before the final version. Um, create munitions is exactly that. A loop of silver, you just make ammunition. You just, just make some. Um, uh, sonic interference. Um, you, it's a it's a twenty foot cone. Gives creatures disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks for a, a round. You just, you know make a weird funny sound and they get a headache um it's a pretty simple spell the summon microbots where you create little nano machines uh because i don't know it's just really funny <laughs> um yeah you can summon uh, uh decon uh, like uh destructive destruction or reconstruction microbots uh reconstruct uh, sort of like destroyer ones just do a lot of damage and the reconstruction ones have a repair ability that can repair creatures and objects uh Tesla bomb does lightning damage, uh, halves their speed, and forces them to you know, fail reactions. Ten for radius, like a simple spell. Arcane matrix, um, while surrounded by the lattice, uh, target has half cover from all sources originating from sources, uh, from outside its space and gains two d six temp at the start of its turns. Um, so yeah, it's just a protective abjuration spell. Uh, lock on, I really like lock on. <laughs> For the duration of the target has disadvantage on stealth checks. Additionally, attack rolls made against the target are made with advantage and score a critical hit on a roll of 19 or 20. 
this spell is really fucking strong. I can't remember if I cut this thing here. It's, that's what red text means. It means something I'm considering cutting or changing. Mostly just so I can scroll through and be like, oh, this. And I look at it and, you know, I, I'll make a decision on it. Um, but yeah, I, lock on is really strong in a very obvious way. But I, I do also kind of like it. Um, talk. Talk is a silly spell. Uh, mostly because there's a whole lot of words to describe uh, boomeranging an object at someone. That's really it. Um, you throw something out on a line, it stops there and stays there, uh, and then it comes back. Um, I'm not going to read through the whole thing. Uh, bubble shield. Uh, the barrier blocks all attack rolls made by creatures outside the barrier, the target a creature inside the barrier. Uh, additionally, you can use your action to move the barrier 20 feet. So, yeah, it is... Um, you make a bubble shield. Uh, raise is you destroy an object. Um, if the object is made from metal or stone, you cause it to violently tear itself apart in a flurry of shrapnel. Each creature within uh, 20 feet of the, uh, the destroyed target makes a deck save. They take a bunch of slashing damage. So, yeah. Electromagnetic pulse is basically delayed blast fireball, but it also has a dispel magic effect built into it as well. It's also a much weaker delayed blast fireball, but... Um, and then Mechanical Enhancement allows you to, uh, you know, nano machines a guy and uh, give them 20 AC, double their speed and jump distance, give them advantage on strength saves and saves, gives them fucking resistance to bludgeoning, piercing and slashing, immunity to poison, disease, advantage on weapon attacks. It's, 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 it's a spell for artificers. It's very, very strong. And I'm sure bards sniping this will have a good time with it. You know, like, Swords Bard casts this on themselves and has a crazy AC and, you know, like, but... If a spell is fun for bards to steal, but isn't, like, absurdly broken, eh, it's probably fine. Probably. Maybe. <laughs> um, and then I made some paladin spells as well. Um, so Shielding Smite, which does force damage, and then um, grants you temp, equal to the damage you do. Punishing Smite. Um... The next time you hit them, they are marked, and the next time the marked creature hits another creature with an attack or targets another creature with a damaging spell, it must make a wisdom save and a failure. It takes um, necrotic and psychic damage, and the damage dealt by the attack or spell is halved. I really like Punishing Smite. I think it's cool. Uh, Divine Conduit. You extend the reach of your oath-bound powers to another creature that you can see within range. For the duration, the target exudes the effects of any aura feature you possess to the same radius that you would, such as aura protection, aura of courage, or the oath of devotion's aura of devotion. Uh, the target uses your t statistics to determine the effects of each ex uh, exuded aura where applicable. Spells that interact with class features are weird. But I found that they're generally okay. Um, like a third level spell that has this effect only lasts a minute. It's a bonus action to set up. Like you can extend your aura of courage or your, or more specifically your aura of protection as a paladin. And that's, that's pretty good. Um, I can't remember if I scrapped divine shield or not. I don't remember. Um, guiding Smite, the next time you hit a creature with a melee, melee weapon attack during the spell's duration, the target is surrounded by Holy Light, the attack deals extra radiant damage, and attack rolls made against them are made with advantage. It is, it is Guiding Bolt, but better, uh, which I think is fun. Uh, Siphoning Smite, the next time you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack during the spell's duration, your weapon takes a piece of their life essence, they take extra damage, and you choose a creature, and then they regain hit points. Simple as, really. And did I keep Divine Shield? That is the question. Divine... I did! Did I change it? Yes. So, I changed this version of it to, until the spell ends, the target gains a plus 5 bonus to AC and takes no damage from Magic Missile. They just gain shield for an hour. Additionally, at the start of the target's turns for the duration, it gains temporary hit points equal to 2d8 plus your spell casting ability modifier, which lasts until the spell ends. Creature under the effects of this spell cannot gain the benefits of the shield spell. Um, so yeah, that was that was that was those. I'm um, I like a lot of these. Mostly the artificer ones I really like because uh, uh, talk is hilarious. Uh, I think talk is really fun. Oh, stretch. I'm very thirsty. Oh. What is next? Repository. Yeah, that, so 
Um, next up is one of the redesigns of a product, one of my earlier, the repository of arcane auditor auditees. Like, I'm like talking so fast, I'm like losing track of my words midway through. <laughs> Uh, but the repository is, um, there's two of them, there's uh, big compendiums of magic items. I have the, the Archive of Esoteric Secrets as well, which is a big repository of spells, that's why I make so many spells on here. Um, and um, yeah, I redesigned that on stream, but I'm not going to spend a million years going through everything that I made, because we will be here for forever, and I've been talking non-stop for nearly three hours now, and I'm very tired. <laughs> um, after that, we're up to stuff I did very recently. Like, like actually very, very recently. Um, uh, so next up are fiendish character options, which I, I, I'm very, I'm very happy with because they're really cool. So fiendish character options. We have the Implin. Um, so you're a, you're a goblin imp. Um, you know, you are a goblinoid that was corrupted by uh, Fiena, the Archduke of Phlegathos, and um, turned into a fiendish creature, and they're, they're mischievous little dudes that live in the lower plains. They are, uh, just because they're part fiend, they're not actually evil, they're, they're just like mischief. Um, that's kind of their thing. Uh, they have fire resistance, they have the reveler ability that satyrs get, they have um, dark vision, they count as... Um, both fiends and humanoids, which is cool, and they can manifest their soul as a little flame that hovers around them. And whilst it's there, they can cast Firebolt, they, sh they uh, illuminate the area around them, and they can explode, uh, which I think is really funny. Um, they explode in a 10-foot radius, uh, do a little bit of damage, fill the area with, uh, with smoke, and then Team Rocket blast off into the sky, uh, and... Uh, yeah, they, they, they fly a distance up to their walking speed, which I think is just hilarious. <laughs> it's just hilarious. Um, I, I absolutely love Flame Burst. Uh, AJ recently finished some art of the implants because they're going in a book that's coming out later on this this year. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Um, I will say no more on the subject, but... Um, the, I need to actually go find it. Yeah, I will. I will grab the art for the implants because they're they're pretty great. I I really like them. It's taking this time. I was thinking about it. Yeah, there we go. There they are, little implant dudes, little little, little goblin buds. I very much like the implant. They're, uh, they're funny little guys. Um, uh, yeah, other other stuff we did there was uh, we we uh, yeah the other fiendish options. We got Path of Hellfire. I have this weird thing with making barbarian subclasses. I make them all the time. I was there was a there was a period in time where I distinctly remember telling people several people, and I think on stream as well, that like it's really hard to make barbarian subclasses because all the design space has been explored. Turns out, past me, very few brain cells, very very smooth brain, uh, because it's actually really easy and really fun. Because there's all kinds of bullshit you can do with Barbarian and just be like, yeah, it works. I think my, my, my realistic point was making Barbarian that isn't just magical in some way is very difficult, which is true, but you could also just say, I don't care to that, and uh, make them all magic inexplicably anyway, which is exactly what I do. For the most part, anyway. Um, but yeah, the, um, there's like the, the two fiendish subclass options is Path of Hellfire. Um, you can do a Hellfire Strike as you can replace an attack by slamming the ground and doing a big wave of fire. Um, and at 6th level, a few times per day, you can either uh, you can push people away and knock them prone, you can create magical darkness, uh, or you can uh, frighten dudes. Uh, you can also, you also gain the ability to see through magical darkness, so, uh, this is good shit. And you slowly start turning into a demonic creature as well. Vengeance of the Night, you can cast Hellish Rebuke at will using Constitution as your spellcasting ability modifier, which I think is cool as fuck. Um, you can just cast Hellish Rebuke at will, and I just think that's really neat. Um, uh, even while you're raging, specifically. 
uh, fiendish exaltation yeah you gain immunity to fire damage your health fire strike ex uh, extends from you in a 20 foot radius or a 30 foot cone so the area is bigger and when you use Hellfire Strike, the affected area becomes difficult terrain to hostile creatures in the start of your next turn. And additionally, you become a fiend, uh, in addition to your other creature types. And you start looking like a fiend as well. So yeah, I, I love Path of Hellfire. I think it's it's really cool, it's really sinister. I, I, think it's, I just think it's really fun. Uh, and then there's Fiendish Origin Sorcerer, um, where you can brand someone with an unhallowed brand. Uh, when you damage one or more creatures with a spell, or one or more creatures fail a saving throw against a spell you cast, you may choose a number of creatures. Number, uh, a number of those creatures you can see and mark them with your unhallowed brand. The brand appears, however, you choose and remains on the target for one minute. Next time you deal damage to the branded creature with a weapon attack or spell, or that creature fails a saving throw against a spell you cast, the mark detonates, dealing 1d6 force damage. Um, you could mark a number of creatures equal to a proficiency bonus, after which you can't do so again until you finish a short long rest, and unless, unless you spend one sorcery point to do so again. So basically, you can basically go one, two. It works with sorcerers quite well because you quicken a spell, mark a bunch of creatures, quicken another thing, or, or cast a spell as your action, and pop one or more of those marks, which is very strong and just get extra damage basically for free. Uh, damnable sign, whenever your creature becomes uh, marked by your unhallowed brand feature, that creature suffers the following penalties. As is marginal next to how attack roll makes, its speed is reduced by 10 feet. Additionally, whenever you detonate your unhallowed brand, you may spend one sorcery point to instantly teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space you can see, where you, you know, you summon your fiendish brand on a thing. And a scornful dismissal, as a bonus action, you point to a creature marked by your unhallowed brand feature that you can see, that creature makes a charisma save and a failure, the brand is detonated and the target is banished to a harmless demiplane. While there, the target is incapacitated. It basically, it is banished. It's, it's banishment. It's, it's the same thing. Uh, and you can do it once per day unless you spend five sorcery points to do it again. I really like this feature. It's, it, it's quite good fun. Um, and then Call From Below allows you to cast Summon Fiend. You can cast it with material opponents, you can cast it once without a spell slot, and you get the ability to do so once per long rest. Additionally, a Fiendish Spirit you summon with the spell can detonate your unhallowed brand with its attacks. Uh, whenever, you start, whenever you start casting a spell, you can modify it so it doesn't require concentration. If you do, the spell's duration becomes one minute for the casting. This ability is very, very strong, because Summon Fiend is a 6th level spell, and the Fiend you summon is really fucking strong. However, it is pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we say. Um, there's also this Fiend Touch ability, which is like Fate Touch. You get Darkness, and then you can choose an Enchantment or Evocation spell. Simple as, really. It's, it's very basic. Um, but yeah, I really like all of these. Hellfire is cool, Fiendish Soul is cool, Implins, I, I really like Implins. I think they're funny little guys. Um, yeah, I, 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 I really like uh, Implins. I, I, I think they're really fun. Um... save there are also the new feats we're, we're almost done actually we've almost been through everything which is good because i'm really fucking thirsty <laughs> i feel like i'm gonna die <laughs> uh but i went through and i made a bunch of new feats i changed up the feat system and made a minor feats system which allows you to move all of the shit feats, all the feats that are just not mechanically relevant in combat, and allows you to still pick them without shooting yourself in the foot. Like, actor is a fun feat, but you shouldn't have to pass up actually having a good character to get it. Um, so, minor feats, you get one at level 1, you get one at level 5, you get one at level 10, and one at level 15. You can also replace an ASI um, with um, taking an... Uh, taking, so, in, so when you get an ASI, you can add plus 1 instead of plus 2. Um, and then take a minor feat as well. Because a lot of the minor feats used to be half feats anyway. They would give you plus one to a stat and then give you a benefit. Whereas now, just, just cut out the middleman. You can just take the half feat. Um, you know, all of them are half feats now. And then I made some new general feats as well. Like I I made Artful Dodger. You can take the dodge action as a bonus action. You can do it a number of times per day when you take the dodge action. Um, when a creature you can see misses you with an attack roll, you see them deck save, you can immediately move up to 10 feet. Subject to the fact that allows you to make a deck save, you can. Um, to take only half damage, you can use your reaction to take no damage. Um, like, like, Awful Dodger just makes you good at dodging. Uh, Defender is, um, just gives you benefits to being a frontline tank guy. I reworked Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter to, you know, 
to be minus proficiency plus double proficiency to damage. Um, Grappler got buffed to not be fucking terrible. Um, Interceptor for, for protection fighting style. Um, Slasher got buffed to not be shit. Titan build is a new thing for so larger, you can hold larger creatures' weapons. And then we went through and made like a bunch of minor feats for like, it was like a burglar and uh, this is this is the mostly from the feats for skills. Um, or no, oh, the, a lot of the feats from Tasha's and like some of the ones that didn't make it in from Tasha's, plus some new ones as well. Like Dungeon Delver is a minor, minor feat, it's a cool feat. Uh, Linguist is here. Um, Tavern Brawler and Weapon Master are minor feats. You know, it's shit like that. Oh god, my throat hurts. I'm so th <laughs> I'm starting to lose my voice. I'm, de I'm definitely gonna have to stop soon, which it works because I'm almost done. Um, the last two things there is Beast. Um, where I reworked basically all of 5e's beasts and made a bunch of new ones. I released it on the guild quite recently. It was surprisingly quite successful for such a short product. I'm actually planning on doing another one. It's my next project. I'll be starting next week. It's called Gollum. We're doing constructs this time and making the constructs interesting. Also making lots of new ones too, because there's not that many. Um, so yeah, we, we basically, I went through and I made all the beasts more interesting. Like, they're just kind of cool now. Um, like a lot of, you know, like the cats all have cat's grace. It's basically spurred on by the fact that in base 5e cats don't have, have dark vision, can't land on their feet, um, and um, uh, oh, what, is, what is the other thing? Oh, oh and they're physically incapable of, of, uh, of long jumping or no, high jumping, should I say they're physically incapable of it, whereas elephants can jump 9 feet in the air, which in real life physically can't, can't do because they don't have ankles well, they, they, they do have ankles, but their ankle is their knee, I think I forget how it works specifically, but there is a specific reason elephants are physically incapable of jumping. Um, also, they're heavy as shit, so I guess that's that probably plays into it a little bit as well, but it's... pretend I'm smart. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, like, obviously Beast does not look like this. Beast is a, it's a very pretty PDF. Um, let, me, let me go open it and show. Oh, I opened the wrong, I opened entirely the wrong thing. I opened Angel's Mortal Manual, which uh, the beast. Go over to screen capture. <laughs> I like how it blurred me slightly when I was doing that. It's enhanced it quite a bit. It was great. Um, so yeah, this this is beast. It's a very pretty cover. Um, you got you got your you got your cover here. Um, utilizing beasts. We've got rules for. Uh, taming beasts as a downtime activity, beast familiars, shit like that. And then we got all the beast statistics. You know, you go through, there's some new ones like chameleons and um, a lot of reworked old ones. Electric eels are new. Uh, what else we got? Like geckos. <laughs> um, lots of giant animals. Let me skip past those because they're all exactly what they say on the tin for the most part. I reworked hyenas, because hyenas are shit in 5e for no reason, even though they're like they're actually like you know pretty 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 scary. Reworked octopus. Oh. Uh, owls, panthers, ox. Yeah, this is, this is a beast basically. Um go back to the word dot capture. But uh yeah, that was that was that was uh, like I, I was really happy with beasts. It, it it did it also did very well, so you know, definitely like it for that. Um, and I, I want to do another one. I want to do, I want to do it all on stream. I might even do the layouting process on stream because that sounds fun. Um, but yeah, the, the last thing and the most recent thing I made, save for the Astromancer stuff I was literally just working on like the, the other week and was finishing up, um, is the Path of Pain, Barbarian. Oh, I haven't actually uh, put it in. I think it's still in my unfinished section. He says, unable to find it. What did I do with it? Where did it go? Uh, where is it? Where's it gone? <laughs> did I not save like a word doc of it or something? 
I guess I didn't. Hang on. I I I have it. I have it in like um. I have it in like a Google Doc. Let me let me go find it. Oh, oh no. Yeah, that is the right one. Okay. Open a new Word document. Right, so Path of Pain uh, basically allows you to... Um... Yeah, it's going pretty good. I'm just about to finish up. Um, I did I did start, like, very early today because I knew... I, I, I had to, like, work around some stuff tonight and I knew that I was going to take ages and it turns out, yeah, I've been going for three hours. This is actually the last thing on my list. I've been sort of going back through. Thought it'd be going up tomorrow, so... Um... um... But yeah, the Path of Pain I made sort of a few weeks ago. It's probably about eight or nine weeks ago now. Because um, I worked on Astromance for quite some time. And took quite a few breaks um, in the middle because I was very busy. Um, basically, I imagine there's quite a few people here um, at the moment. So I imagine someone here has played Bloodborne. Um, so, you know in Bloodborne when you take damage, you get a little bit of that orange health. I think it's orange, I can't remember. Uh, but you, uh, it's called the rally mechanic, where if you hit something right after taking damage, you get some of your health back. That is this. That is exactly what this is. Uh, whenever you take damage while you're raging, add one-fourth of that to your resilience meter, minimum of one, which is a pool of hit points you can tap into to recover from pain. When you deal damage to a hostile creature with a melee weapon attack, if your resilience meter has one or more hit points, you can spend a number of hit points from your resilience meter up to, the, up to an amount equal to the damage dealt or the amount left in your resilience meter, whichever is lower. If you do, you regain that many hit points. It has a hit point maximum you to a barb level plus your proficiency bonus and your rope. And you lose all remaining hit points when your rage ends. That's basically how it works. It's very simple. It makes you very hard to kill. Um, when you expend hit points, so at six, when you expend hit points for your resilience meter of a part of damaging a hostile creature with a melee weapon attack, the target of the attack takes psychic damage equal to half the hit points expended. You do a bit of extra psychic damage on him. It's cool. As a bonus action, you spend all the hit points in your resilience meter at 10th level. You and each allied creature within 30 feet of you that can see you gain temporary hit points equal to the number of hit points expended, which lasts for a minute. You can do that once per short long rest. You know, once, like all, all of us are low, I'll spend my resilience and we'll power through this. And then impossible resilience is, uh, um, it just increases your resilience meter. I think this 14th level feature is honestly kind of boring. Like, it's the kind of thing I would go back through and probably change. But it does also increase your your meter, like it basically doubles your meter and then some, as long as your con score is good, which it should be. Because at that level, at 14th level, your your score is it's like 19, so, and your con score at this sort of level should probably be at least 16. It's you know bring it, it basically doubles it. It means that you have you know 30 extra hit points uh, ready. For, well. If, if you if you take six uh, uh, you uh, yeah if, if if you take 60 damage you add 15 to your to your meter um, and realistically the, the the way you add to your meter very quickly is you take lots of little attacks that get reduced down to one so if you take like 10 attacks that do like two damage to you you will gain 10 hit points on your meter as opposed to one attack that hits you for 60 you're gonna gain you know 15 points. Um, which, you know, is more, but you've also taken, you know, 60 damage as opposed to 20 damage. But I really like Path of Pain. I think Path of Pain is, is very cool. I've, um, whilst uh, hasn't been played yet, AJ is, uh, has, uh, has, has uh, built a, a, a Path of Pain Barbarian. But we're starting at level 2 and the campaign hasn't even started yet, so, you know. No, no, no word on whether it's super broken or not yet. Oh. <sighs> Okay, my, th my voice is fucking shot. So I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much for folks who have sort of have stuck around, uh, especially uh, like regulars who have, who have been in and out like over the past like couple years. Um, I'm not quite at my two year anniversary yet because I have done quite a few of the extra of these streams. But even, even so, like my two year anniversary is sometime next month. I'm gonna do something. I don't know what. It's probably going to be playing Sonic Robo-Blast 2 Cut. What I did last year was fun, but it destroyed my voice, and it's not something I really want to do again. It's the kind of experience I want to have once. I, I wrote a one-shot in a day. 
well i created a bunch of notes for a one shot in a day and it was fun but man don't want to do it again <laughs> Um, so I will probably play Sonic Robo Blast 2 Kart with friends because any excuse to play Sonic Robo Blast 2 Kart is, I mean, it's a good excuse. And anyone who doesn't know what the fuck I'm talking about, you're probably in for a treat. Um, uh, I do these kinds of streams every Monday, save for next Monday, because I am actually busy next Monday. Uh, and at the t for the time being, I'm doing them every Friday as well. Usually I would be starting around now, but I knew this was going to take a while today, so I started you know, very, a bit much earlier. Um, I, yeah, I do these every Monday, 5 p.m. Um, a, a 5 p.m. BST, um, or GMT, depending on time of year, you know, how it is. Um, and, um, yeah, it's sort of, um, go, like, um, and a Friday, sort of, same, same time. Um, tend to play Pokemon games on a Wednesday, during a sort of, uh, uh, 2 p.m. BST. Uh, but yeah, I say uh, thank you very much for the people who have raided. Thank you very much to, to, to regulars and, 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 and lurkers and the sort. Um, I'm going to go head off here and go take a drink and then also probably do some editing. So I, I have actual like work to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, if you want to look at any of my stuff on the guild, you've got a preview of a good amount of it today. Um, I will I will jam in my, my the link to my, my portfolio. You can go see all the stuff that I've had a hand in, some of my own stuff stuff I've collaborated on, stuff I've edited for other people. Uh, a lot of great people I've worked for, a lot of um, lot of products I'm very proud of uh, to either have made myself or have uh, collaborated on. Um, I've been designing for this game for seven years now. Um, uh, you know, this is, this, this is my life. This is what I do. Uh, this, is what, this is what I enjoy. Uh, designing for this game is my pride and joy. I absolutely love it. Um, there's just so many little things for me to toy around with and it's you know it, it it's it's i don't know it's it's good it's good but yeah i'll say thank you very much once again um people can hit buttons if they want whatever i don't care like you you can leave and never think about this again i i'm it's not gonna bother me uh, but if you want to stick around for other stuff you can press the buttons do the things whatever like something something generic ring the bell i don't i don't care like it's some something something press the buttons um i will see if there's anyone to raid i haven't raided anyone in fucking forever there is not so never mind i i like is it, I'll, i guess i'll see if i'll see if there's there's never there never is but i'll go and see if there's anyone doing like like actual like design work um, on, like, D&D. &D. There's always, always just live plays and stuff, but, um, I'll see if there's anyone doing design work. Design work, design work, design work. Nope, no, there isn't. So, yeah. I will head off here. Thank you very much for sticking around. I will hopefully see some of you either next Monday for Pokemon stuff or next Friday, because I'm going to start working on Gollum. So I want to make some constructs. So, yeah.